alliances here is the emissions in terms of grams of CO2 equivalent per gigawatt hour for these technologies on the life cycle scale. So it's not only direct emissions, but also everything that happens upstream, upstream which might be important for methane, for example, uh, so natural gas, which is methane, uh, because they may be engaged, of course, upstream in the supply chain. So all these technologies, the ones on the left, they need carbon. In this picture, you may see that natural gas seems Look, it looks like a transition technology because coal is worse, <laughs> but it's only because coal is worse that nat uh, natural gas is still expected as a technology. That's a personal opinion, but this is how it looks like on the, in the picture. And then if you add carbon capture and storage, the first surprise for those who, who may not know is that you actually don't fall to zero because you don't capture anything. Uh, carbon capture and storage works on site and upwards to maybe 90% of what's in the So you still have some carbon emitting on site at the power plant that is still emitting in the atmosphere. And most importantly, everything that happens in the supply chain is not being captured. So it's actually quite difficult, even for a gas power plant, to pull under 100 grams of CO2 equivalent per hour. And then you have all the low carbon ones on the right, uh, starting with hydro, I won't go into detail, but it's highly variable. Topography on the side, on the size of your turbine and the site, the reservoir as well. Nuclear, which we found uh, very low carbon, and I will explain why afterwards. So right here, and then uh, solar. The eight categories here are solar. You have conserved, conserved solar, which are actually quite specific to a certain set of countries. I don't think uh, it's, it's. I don't think it will be difficult for them to start a specific plan, for example. But photovoltaics here uh, are actually one of the most promising ways to decarbonize, uh, of course, because you can install photovoltaics everywhere. And even in the less, uh, let's say less sunny regions, you still end up with carbon footprints that are a bit low, that are quite low, under 100 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. And so that variation that you can see for each technology depends on the region where this technology is installed. Uh, for renewables, they are independent on the grid for solar radiation wind on the wind regimes as well. And for fossils, the dependence is mostly on the supply chain of, the, of coal and gas. But now let's focus a little bit more on nuclear. For those who have seen a little bit these numbers, uh, and actually uh, it's a lot of questions I get, it's why do you find it so low? Because if you look at literature, nuclear power has somewhere between maybe 10 and 100 grams of CO2 equivalents, and that's most importantly reported by the ACC. So we tried to move our model uh, to actually try to find back and back into the game. And what we see, uh, we don't have to spend too much time with your questions, I'd be happy to, to, to discuss it, is that we actually can find a range of 5 to 122 grams. But you have to push the model into extreme limits. For example, with very low oil grade uranium, which no one exploits at the moment, you may end up at 90 grams per kilowatt. But most of uranium today is extracted actually at much higher rates than that. And if you go to the high rates that you can find in Canada, for example, uh, you fall down to 5 grams of CO2 equivalent. But on average, globally, we're at about 6 grams. Another difference with literature is that literature that's older than 10 years will account for enrichment of uranium with a different technique that we use today. And that technique, called gas diffusion, actually consumes 50, 50 times more energy centrifugation that we use today. So if you look at this uh, literature, you will find numbers that are much higher, such as 30 grams, for example, if you actually set it up to 100% gas station. So since we have, today we have also a, a thinner grid, so everything that uses electricity will have a uh, lower carbon footprint. Uh, mining is not done by, well, it's still done by underground and pit mining, but most of the mining is still actually today is into leaching, which has a lower carbon footprint. We use uh, only centrifugation, so it's actually quite energy efficient to enrich uranium. And uh, the last part is that actually, the, if you look at the high numbers in literature, they're usually looking at all grades that we don't really have today and that we don't really expect in the future. So all in all, that explains why well, we find the number that low and how that actually fits in this system here. That's, I wanted to say that. So it's, uh, it's, I'm, I'm quite confident with, with this number uh, because we actually shoot the model in all directions and so that it's quite close. 
But now that's only Windows guesses, right? Uh, we also collaborated with Power and Data, if you know that website, to actually show the numbers we found for the end use for the new electricity. Uh, and we saw that from the access Time to build a new reactor, and actually there are a lot of technical assessments that take into account the delay 
Thank you very much, Thomas. So, uh, now uh, it's envisioned that we will have a Q&A here to uh, Lars Rabian and Thomas Gibbon. And uh, can you, you can hear us, Thomas? Very well, yes. Loud and clear. Okay, good. So, uh, should we start out and see any questions from the audience? Who's the, who's the brave one? There's a question down here. Please uh, introduce yourself and, and yeah. state your question. Yeah, and please, uh, all questions, try to keep them short and not uh, with, with long introductions, okay? Thank you. Hi, my name is Christian, and I'm a Danish university student. Um, both of you discuss a lot about the technologies of nuclear energy. One concern that some people voice is that making this technology and the materials for it more available will also make a nuclear vet weapons and the like more available. Do you see this as a legitimate concern? And if so, how would you address it? And the question was to Thomas or Lars Rabin? The question is for... Okay, for let's Rabin. start out with Lars Rabin, please. Well, uh, thank you uh, for the question. Yes, that it is, of course, a concern that some of the, uh, the processes uh, have the ability to, to create material for dirty bombs, if you want. Uh, we have not seen any, though. Uh, and nuclear power has been used for almost 80 years. So uh, I think it's something that can be dealt with. Uh, there are also new technologies, as I understand it, uh, that uh, will be consuming the waste from tr more traditional reactors, uh, which does not render the, uh, the spent material uh, capable of uh, making uh, bombs or anything of that nature. So I, th I think it's, it's, it's also the general question of waste. Can it, be, can it be dealt with? I think it's an emotional question, considering uh, the quantities uh, that are being produced. Uh, Finland has solved the problem uh, by digging into the bedrock in Finland and submerging 
uh, spent material uh, for thousands and thousands of years. This can be done very safely, no problem. You just need, need to put an economic value of, uh, or negative value on, on the waste, then sure, uh, people will find a way of digging it down in the ground. So I think it can be dealt with. Okay. Thank you, Lars. Uh, Thomas? Yes, that's, that was a really good answer. I don't have much to, to add. Uh, I think it's true that the uh, nuclear power and nuclear weapons have a common share history at the very beginning. But I think in most countries it has been deteriorated now. The, the main concern is about what happens to the waste. But uh, as was said, as long as you have a good regulation to trace the waste, if you actually know where it is and if you take care of it, there's not much concern. The other concern might be about enrichment. But to enrich uh, uranium at the rate you need for nuclear will be much, much, much more time and energy than you need for uh, uranium and nuclear power plants. So a nuclear power plant is about 3 to 5% enrichment, and a bomb will be about 90%. So it's a lot of effort. Um, it's, it's, it would take a very committed uh, government to do that. And I don't think we have seen it. Good, thank you. Uh, next question. We have. We, I think this. He was first, and then we have noted you down here. Yeah, Thomas. Please introduce yourself and place the question. Hello, my name is uh, Thijs Palm. I'm from uh, Foreninger Atomkraft Attack, the Danish pro-nuclear organization. Um, you were speaking of uh, build times, uh, Mr. Gibbon. Um, in the Danish debate, we always hear about the very delayed EPR reactors. Um, would you say that's a scientifically fair representation of how expensive and how long it takes to build a nuclear power plant? Or is it fair in some way to call it the cherry picking of the data? Mm -hmm. That's a very really good question. Uh, we often forget that the first EPRs were actually not built in Europe, were built in China, this detachment uh, reactor. And that has been built in, I think, six or seven years. So it really depends on, on the willpower you have, uh, domestically, on the know-how of your contractors. Uh, the main problem in France is that we have lost a lot of civility to the French people. But we have lost a lot of, uh, of, of our capacity and our know-how in, in welding. And so it has been an iterative process, right? We have, I think we have to replace uh, the, the main part of the reactor once already since the beginning because they were defaults in the, in the making. And that's one issue maybe that we need a nice, a good fabric, a good ecosystem of, of know-how of contractors that can do their job well uh, to reduce that, that time. There's also um, permitting time that might delay the, the reactor construction. And I know that the law has been voted in this year in French Parliament to accelerate that go through all the groups, you would need to actually get your permit. So if you combine better training of, of teams for, for, for the building, uh, better permitting on the regulatory side, uh, you could actually get there much faster. And also, as I said, since it's a first of a kind and fair out of terms, you don't have a lot of uh, working experience. But if you're able to build on that, then as well done in the 70s in France, you could actually build the fair writers almost top the mill. Thank you. And we will actually, <coughs> later today in the program, we will hear from uh, Kjernfull next, the Swedish company, that uh, if I, actually... If I may just add a comment, yes, uh, perhaps That's relating to this, and this is of course one of the ideas about the, the new reactor types that are being discussed, small modular reactors where uh, they are serious produced in a, in a shipyard or in a big factory hall, uh, they are being pre-authorized, uh, approved by the, the authorities, uh, which will change completely the cost picture and the time picture for installing these. What we, what we do need to see, we need to see that at a scale and installed uh, to be convinced, but I think that will happen within the next three to five years. Wait, I think next one is here, Thomas. So please introduce yourself and quick question. Thank you. My name is Torbjörn Jarkson. I'm from Liberal Alliance. And uh, I'm really curious to hear your, uh, Thomas Gibbons, your words on 
critical materials, metals and minerals, for uh, low carbon emission technologies. Talking about wind, solar and nuclear, what are the most critical ones that you can, uh, can talk about in those cases? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we, we hear a lot because we basically need more for the green energy that you can produce all across the board, including both materials such as concrete, uh, aluminium, copper, and steel, both other renewables, but also some specific materials. It doesn't have to be uh, so specific materials, uh, so of course you need uh, you need on you need uh, yeah, so several types of, of compounds that but I'm not so concerned about the specialty materials. Uh, the, the, I think the main concern for wind turbines is the permanent magnet, and you need neodymium or praseodymium or dysprosium, all these fancy materials to be able to get rid of a, of a gearbox, but you can also put a gearbox in a wind turbine that doesn't require as much of these materials. So I think there will be substitution possibilities, including for PV technologies. Um, I'm, I'm maybe I'm personally more concerned about the amount of copper we need for all these technologies because of the connections. And now we see that most um, high voltage direct current lines have been using increasingly uh, aluminium in, in this space uh, because copper is becoming rarer and rarer in, uh, in this context. So I think it's less a problem that with fossil fuels, for example, it's very difficult to find substitutes for fossil fuels. We're still struggling to find substitute for oil. Some say that you know biofuels or e-fuels will, will save us, but uh, I'm much more concerned. But yeah, <laughs> oil than for than for materials. Materials will always probably find a cheaper substitute if that's needed, uh, and I've, we've seen that also with batteries. Uh, we can do batteries without cobalt today and almost without lithium if necessary. So I'm, I'm more confident on the material side of things than the. the fossil fuel side of things. I don't know if that answers your question, uh, but I think we'll find mostly substitutes if we think economically, yeah. Side of things than the, the fossil fuel. And, and Thomas, just uh, uh, we have one down there afterwards. Yeah. Preben Bier from uh, EDA uh, Expert Group. Uh, Thomas, you, when you showed the comparison uh, of various technologies and uh, their LCA uh, and CO2 equivalent uh, emissions, you had, I think, five uh, different uh, solar PVs and uh, three different uh, wind uh, technologies. But nuclear, it was only average. Um, I assume it was uh, EPR uh, average. But now Lars uh, also talked about SMR, and that's probably more relevant in a Danish uh, context. How would that look like? Yeah, um, uh, yeah. so just to, now, to Lars, clarify, this uh, was for uh, an average pressurized water reactor, relevant in a and I don't think context. I've said How that anywhere. That yeah. like? So it's because I only had average numbers globally, so I could only model the, the typical reactor today, and I used PVR, uh, take the, yeah, uh, build up materials for, for this. For EPR, the numbers would be comparable uh, because they are both a little bit bigger and take a little bit more of, uh, of technology on board. So all in all, the economy of scale kind of offsets the, the fact that they're a little bit more technology uh, oriented. Uh, it's It will be more or less the same. I, would, I assume between five and 10 grams uh, yeah, because technology is largely similar as well. Um, but there are, I think, one or two uh, publications now with EPR, and I should try to find them. But I would say between five and ten, yeah. Thank you. We'll have time for one last question. Please introduce yourself <coughs> and a quick question. Uh, my name is Jens. I'm a Danish physics student. I have a question to you, Mr. Gibbon, about uh, solar photovoltaics. So I could see that the carbon intensity varied a lot uh, regionally from some 8 grams to some 80 grams. Um, where would you say we are here in Denmark? We want to build like some 10 gigawatts of solar photovoltaics here. As I understand it, most of it is made in China uh, with a very dirty grid. So is the n are the numbers uh, 
for like Danish produced solar photovoltaics where we have a clean grid or is it imported Chinese solar photovoltaics? The numbers refer to, do you understand my question? Yeah, there are actually several questions. Like Danish the, produced solar photovoltaics. The, just to answer on the, it's true that China controls most of the supply chain of uh, making photovoltaics. Uh, and what you would do if you start building them in Denmark is would probably happen at the end of that supply chain anyway, right? So the extraction of materials will still happen in China and maybe the refining as well. And then maybe you can use these materials. And I think most of the impacts uh, for photovoltaics actually occur for the, the silicon production. So you need to reach a very high grade of, uh, of silicon to make it uh, efficient for photovoltaics. Uh, so that will be, that's the most energy intensive part. So if you manage to do this in Denmark, then you actually save quite a lot of the footprint. And then of course, there's the, um, the normal irradiation. So that the amount of solar radiation you can get per year, which vary you know, from simple to double across Europe. Uh, I think the south of Spain has twice the amount of sun that, that Finland has, for example. Uh, so you would have mechanically your footprint that would double in Finland compared to Spain, even for the exact same sort of panel uh, per kilowatt hour. So I think in Denmark, it would be about, I don't know, 50 grams maybe. I think France is 35. So maybe Denmark is 50 or 45. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas. Just uh, now that we have Lars Rebin up here in, in the panel, I just had uh, one, sing one single question here to you is, when you're now looking at the landscape, and I know that you've already uh, just stretched your head out the window, as you said, uh, politically, but uh, do you envision that we should set up some kind of, uh, let's say, think tank for nuclear or something to include the, the international knowledge industry and so forth uh, in Denmark? The way we in, uh, intend to do that at the Novo Nordisk Foundation is that we are opening calls in this fall uh, for scientific papers on projects in nuclear uh, that can apply for funding. And uh, we have set aside 120 million Danish kroner uh, to be donated for good scientific papers that will be qualified by an international panel of experts. Uh, the only uh, requirements is that it is uh, anchored at a Danish university, but that it has significant international uh, academic and science impact um, by, by having collaboration because we want to raise the knowledge level in Denmark, which has been, excuse me, bent, uh, you probably, there are only fewer you left. Uh, <laughs> there are not so many politicians. Um, so, so we need to increase that, and that's only one way uh, to, to increase the, uh, the knowledge in Denmark. Then the other way is to uh, adopt more students uh, and find an interest. And uh, a third way that I had, actually envisioned was that if we as a country uh, had been able to look across the sound and realize that Sweden is renovating, and you'll hear more about it later mm. in the program, renovating mm. its suite of nuclear reactors, if we had participated in this by funding part of the renovation, we could get electricity and we could get knowledge, mm. uh, which would p put the Danish society in a much, much better position to make the decision at a point in time uh, when the smaller reactors uh, become viable and have demonstrated their worth uh, because I don't think we're going to build a Basebeck or mm. anything similar to that in Denmark. It's not really applicable uh, but smaller reactors can be applicable regional levels in Denmark for big industrial compounds. I can only mention Kallenborg where half the world's insulin is manufactured and uh, other important drugs uh, sugar manufacturing at, at Lolland and cement manufacturing at Aalborg. We could easily find uh, lots of places where energy uh, can be uh, supplied uh, using this new technology, but it requires that we revoke this 1985 political decision. And last night, and this is one of the positive things which I will refer to, last night we had a debate at CEPOS uh, where three political parties, the Danish People's Party, Dansk Folkeparti, uh, conservatives and uh, liberal left, which is not a left-oriented <laughs> company, but it's a liberal company, just for service information. They all agreed uh, that perhaps we should revoke that 85 uh, decision of mm. excluding nuclear power uh, from our future planning. So I think it is coming. Mm. I think Good. it's coming.
Okay, thank you. I think we are out of time for the questioning now. We'll go to the next speaker. And uh, Klaus, uh, has it been shifted over here so we can put... Yeah, uh, please, uh, the next speaker is uh, Johan Solit, who is the founder and manager of the Foining Atomic Power. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, and he's going to tell us a little about the situation in Denmark from his point of view. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Of course, uh, my name is Johan Christian Solit, and uh, I'm here to speak a little bit about, let's see. Um, I don't see my presentation in the, in the no, slideshow, um, but uh, yeah, we'll just take, uh, for the sake of technical issues, we'll just take five minutes of a break to get this sorted out, and then I'll return my uh, presentation okay. afterwards. I think Johan may have been correct. Let's take five minutes, stretch your legs, uh, talk. We don't have so much time, so yeah, it's, better, it's better. Otherwise, we, we are running out of time. Perfect. Um, now we'll return to the presentation. Sorry for the inconvenience. What I will present today is uh, looking at the historical trends of what had happened in Denmark towards uh, energy production, supply and demand. And after that, I'll go into the latest report from uh, the Climate Council, which will always also, after me, uh, present some of their solutions. Uh, first of all, we look at the energy supply uh, by sources the last uh, 30 years in Denmark. And as we can see on the slides behind me, uh, the, the total energy supply in Denmark has been uh, nearly the same in total numbers, around 700 petajoules the last 30 years. The composition of the different sources that have produced the energy in Denmark has, has shifted a lot, of course. As we see with uh, coal has nearly declined totally, uh, and also biomass has, uh, has increased a lot. But at the same time, as we see here in 2009, we see that 3% of the Danish uh, energy production came from wind and solar. And today in 2021, this is 10%. So this is an increase of 7 percentage points in around 11, 11 years, 11 to 12 years. And this is energy, of course. This is not electricity solely, but this is the whole energy system. So this is also why I take this into account, is that this whole system has to be transitioned, not only electricity. And we see the numbers for the other energy sources. For example, biomass accounts for 35% in Denmark. And if we go onwards to the consumption of different uh, kinds of energy in Denmark, then we can see that after the energy has been produced, we also have to consume it. And in the top bar, you can see that heat production accounts for around 20%, and as well as electricity, and you have other direct uses of energy. For example, oil at the bottom that is used for transportation, of course. But the big problem here is that um, in 1990, the um, electricity accounted for 20% of the total Danish energy consumption. And in 2020, it was still 
So we haven't electri electrified our society in the speed anywhere. It's, it's a status quo and the, also the consumption of energy, as you can see, is also stable. It doesn't change that much. So this is a big problem going into a green transition but because it's not only having uh, energy sources that produce green electricity, it's also having an electrification of the society. And we see this forecast by the Danish Energy Agency that shows how the energy has to be produced the next 30 years in Denmark from on, until 2050. And then you see an immense increase in the Danish electricity demand, and that's mainly by power to X systems, and it's by heating, because we go from uh, district heating mainly to electrical heating. You also have transportation and onwards. And this is up to a 7X of the electricity demand that we have today in the next 30 years. And remember, in the last 30 years, we haven't done anything in electricity. So this is going to be a very big challenge. And that's why that a lot of uh, excellent people at, for example, the Climate Council has produced reports to show how to tackle these difficulties. And I'll go through one of the reports that I think they will also repent some solution for later on. And uh, the Climate Council that has put out a report for around a month ago analyzed uh, a Danish energy system where uh, you could have uh, power outages, where you have uh, situations where the weather isn't in your favor and you have some critical moments in your electricity system uh, uh, overall. This is only happening once every 10 years or, or more uh, because it's very um, unlikely to happen. But these, you have to take this into account for electricity system to work, of course. The main, um, the main solution for this report is, of course, wind and solar. And then for the, to cover up the uh, outages, you have other solutions. And they um, come with three solutions. The, um, the gas turbines uh, run by hydrogen or natural gas. Then you'll have the, uh, the rock bed thermal storage. And then you'll have the flexible demand. And also, you'll have a lot of interconnections to our neighboring countries. And uh, this is from 5 to 10 gigawatts. Uh, if you account for the uh, Danish Energy Agency or the uh, ENSO uh, energy uh, predictions for the capacity. And uh, the points of criticism that I have to this report is that I think the report is great, but I think it has a lot of uh, challenges in its conclusions because when you read the report, you see that there's a lot of, um, a lot of things that we don't know anything of. But the conclusion seems like we have it all sorted out and we can could get through this uh, system easily. For example, we have gas turbines. The fuel pi price is very hard to estimate because of it will not it will happen. So uh, it's unknown when these episodes will happen. So the fuel price is what I could see maybe not accounted, but it would not have that big of an impact in the total price. But it's 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 a it's worth of uh, of mentioning. And also the rock bed storage, we haven't seen these uh, scalable projects anywhere. We have uh, not seen it being deployed in any energy system. And as the Climate Council said themselves, the price is unknown. So it's hard to estimate if this is actually going to be a solution for our future energy system when you don't know the cost. And also with the flexible demand, that's very, very uncertain in my opinion because we haven't seen this anywhere, of course. And it's something that has just been introduced to us after the energy crisis, of course, but this was crisis times. We have to live in a society in the next hundreds and thousands of years where we're not going to take a flexible demand as a, a, as a solution. And also, they don't know the externalities of these flexible demand on industries if they have to lower their demand in, 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 in hours where there's not enough production. What is the alternative cost of industries not closing down and not producing their goods? So we don't know these costs, and it's also mentioned in the report, which is hard to calculate these estimates as well. And then to network integration costs, and that's one of the big uh, things that we have to discuss in, in this whole debate is when you, com when you compare different energy technologies, you also have to take external costs of these technologies being uh, introduced to the society. And some of the speakers before me talked a little bit about this, is that, for example, you have to have grid cost. How much does the copper and the cables cost? We, you saw it at Energy uh, Holm, where you have up to uh, 18 billion Danish crowners uh, being uh, for, for, for uh, transmission lines. And you also have profile cost and, and balancing cost for different values of electricity and also for different energy sources behind it being back up. And I've, I see a lack of this being included in these models and being included in the cost of wind and energy, wind and solar, because of course when you build a wind park, you have to have transmission lines. 
also if you build a nuclear plant. But the big difference is just here, it's much more transmission lines and uh, materials you have to put into a transmission system built solely on wind and solar. So this is a big external cost that is not calculated in these analyses from my perspective, what I see. And um, one of the big uh, crit points of criticism is the interconnections, because Denmark is in the future going to be very reliant on electricity from other countries. And in the report, they say to so five to 10 gigawatts hours of interconnections is going to be built. And the big assumption is here in this quote, it says, you can say that with increased import dependence, we place trust in our neighboring countries, both being able and willing to help us in situations where we would otherwise experience shortage of electricity in Denmark. We don't know if the countries will have the proper uh, power capacity to produce this electricity. That is what I read in the report and all, also other reports. It's these internet connections are being built, but when the wind doesn't blow in Denmark and southern Sweden and southern Norway, we'll have a lot of power needed to be generated. And are we going to have, to have faith in Norway and, and, and Sweden to just have power plants to stand, stand, stand by for us in these moments of time? with all of this electricity demand, I don't think so. So I think this assumption is, is very uh, critical. Um, and last but not least, we have the nuclear power is not necessary conclusion in a very short uh, two page uh, in, the, in the bottom of the report. And it's because of the so-called Valco value adjusted level like cost of electricity that they use uh, taken from a report called World Energy Outlook. And I'll just go uh, through some of the assumptions behind this. Um, if we look at the World Energy Outlook report, it's a report that's being uh, published every year, and it's from the International Energy Agency. This report shows a lot of other things than price. Price is actually only mentioned in the, the last pages on 469 and in, uh, around the appendix. You don't have any uh, explanations which kind of plants they take into account. We don't know assumptions. We only know the uh, capital cost and the capacity factor, but we don't know if this is taken on any realistic project. It's very close to this report. It's not a price report. It is a report looking at energy in a total, and it's an outlook every year. And what you can see, these costs is very high. It's around 140, 120, and 105 for the next 30 years for nuclear power. These estimates are based on there being different rates of investments, so different interest rates for nuclear and wind, the doubling of nuclear compared to wind, also different capa very high capital cost and lower um, uh, capacity factors for the production. And even, and then they say the Climate Council that you can use the Valco because it's a system metric. You, you, you cover some values in there. But you have to remember that even the IEA says, in doing so, the Valco provides a metric for cross-technology comparisons. It is important to make clear, however, that this does not include all costs and benefits related to each technology and could be improved by including additional relevant elements such as network integration costs. As talked before, Valco does not include grid cost for transmission lines, balancing cost, or profile cost. Maybe some profile cost because of the value of electricity but there's still a lot of cost missing. And if we go to other estimates by the IEA, they actually make a price report every five years, looking only in a time span of five years, not 30 years into the future. It's called Project the Cost of Generating Electricity, and actually the Danish Energy Agency uses this in their own LCOE calculator, so I don't know why this is never taken into account by any other institutions in Denmark as Climate Council or the different universities, but if you look at this report at the same interest rate, and capital cost based on several projects around Europe made by the IEA, you can see that nuclear is very cost competitive in Europe. At the same different uh, investment rate, it's $45 per megawatt hour compared to offshore wind and 68. Of course, there will be cheaper projects in Denmark. Of course, there will. But the Climate Council and other uh, places, they use European numbers to compare prices in Denmark. So I'll do the same. And if you look at the actual price estimates, the LCOE analysis made by the International Energy Agency that is actually price reports, then we get these numbers. I have, yeah, so I don't know why this is not taken into account and maybe for future analysis this will be. And for uh, closing up, we'll see that this, I, I find a problem in, in a lot of these analyses because 
All around Europe, a lot of countries are going to build nuclear. We have all, a lot of other countries making system analysis showing that nuclear, wind and solar in combination would be a very good solution because in the first 50% of a decarbonization strategy, wind and solar is good. But in the last 50%, it's, it's going to have increasing, uh, increasing returns of scale. So, so decreasing returns of scale because it's harder to actually cover these uh, areas where there's no wind and solar. And their nuclear power is a very good option, which is shown by a lot of other co countries' system analyses. And I don't know what Denmark knows that the other European countries don't know, but some of the reports is made by, let's see here, the uh, OECD for Switzerland, in a GeForce from Sweden. Netherlands has produced three reports and some scientific papers. Poland has their own strategy. France's own transmission, uh, like the, uh, the Energinet in Denmark, uh, released a report. And lastly, a, a report in Nature Energy with 42 countries showing all over the world by some scholars showed that uh, a lot of European countries will have a great time doing both wind, solar, and nuclear to decarbonize their society. Last slide for me is the public opinion in Denmark. So we could still be here and talk about nuclear power and it being like only for the nerds or people that find this energy technology very interesting. But what does the public actually say? In the last seven to eight years in Denmark, we have seen an immense increase in the public opinion towards nuclear power. Back in 2016, it was only 17% that was for and 66% that was against. And if we look at today, we have 49% of the Danish population that tomorrow would vote yes in a referendum about implementing nuclear power in Denmark. And only 32% voting no, and the last 20% is don't know. This is insane. This is an insanely big shift in the public opinion. So when we look at the numbers today, if we had a hypothetical referendum tomorrow and we trust in Megaphone, the most leading public uh, opinion-making company in Denmark that made all of these opinion polls, if we trust them, then this will be the picture. And I would guess if we made an, a, a new opinion poll today, this would be even higher. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, uh, Johan, and, and thank you for uh, speeding up so we could add. We have this little period now until the next speaker we call short questions too, Johan. We can have one. Is there one question from the from Let's the take audience? one question if there is a question. Yeah, we had one here? Yeah, okay. So my name is Nikolai Hammond and I'm working for Seaborg Technologies and I spent 10 years with us before that, so maybe I see a little bit both sides. So I think uh, the reference to the IAEA report is uh, interesting, and I think it's uh, worth noting that it's IRENA, so the International Renewable Energy uh, Organization, that makes these price forecasts. So a lobby organization for renewable energies. Do you think the price picture would be different if you asked the WNA, so the nuclear lobby organization, to predict the prices? Uh, of course it would be that, because you will have other <laughs> estimates, of course. And that's why I don't chose any uh, kind of organization. I chose the IEA in cooperation with the Nuclear Energy Agency, which made the report. Mm. But this is the report that has made year by year by year by the IEA. The project, the cost of generating electricity report, has been made for many years. And it's by no coincidence that our own Danish energy agency uses this report for their own LCOE estimates. So I can't see why we're using a report as World Energy Outlook for the prices when it's, it's, it's not a price report. And you can't see the assumptions. It's not based on plans or anything. I have looked into it. I have talked with authors of both the reports. And if you ask them which report should you refer to, the project, the cost of generating electricity, is the price report of the IEA. Double World Energy Outlook is not a price report. Thank you. Thank you to Johan. Yes. And, uh, would like Klimarådet, the Climate Council, to approach. <laughs> and I now have the pleasure here to, uh, to introduce uh, the Climate Council, Klimarådet, it's called in Denmark, represented by Maria Münster, and also the Danish Technical University, DTU, uh, represented by uh, Jakob Østergaard, head of the division. 
and they will, of course, speak about the reports. I don't, I mean, we'll see whether you just came out with a report just yesterday, I believe, but the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, so um, the Climate Council recently, thank you very much. My name is Marie Münster. I'm a professor in energy system analysis at uh, the Technical University of Denmark, and I'm also a member of the Council uh, for Climate Change in Denmark. So we recently came out with a report. Thank you for introducing it. And we are happy with the, the debate that it is uh, creating. Uh, so we were looking at how can we um, be sure that we have enough electricity all the hours of the year when we're looking into a system where we are uh, increasingly seeing solar and wind coming in. And uh, in that report, we are looking uh, more at the question, do we need nuclear in Denmark in order to have this security of supply? Uh, and not so much do we want nuclear in Denmark, which we don't have any opinion about. Um, so we are looking at this from the Danish point of view. And uh, if we look into uh, a, weather, uh, a difficult weather year in the future, we can see that solar and wind can cover the demand the majority of the time. And I know you are worried farther. And uh, this is kind of the main uh, point of this report, is to say actually wind and solar is maybe better than their reputation. So uh, solar and wind can cover the demand the majority of the time. This is now a, a, a 2040 picture where we've constructed a, a, a difficult weather year for wind and solar to see uh, how can we handle this? And we can see with the, with the green that we have the solar and the wind. Uh, we can see that uh, uh, some hours we have export, and we can also see that there are uh, some hours with import with the light blue on the top. Um, if we look over the year, we kind of have the same picture. So this is for the whole year, and we can see that uh, the solar and the wind can really cover most of the hours. Um, but then we are uh, relying on import 10% of the hours of the year. And this is kind of uh, assuming that we have the electricity market and cooperation that we have today. We also uh, make a very stressed situation where we say, well, what if uh, some, uh, for some reason we have an outage on the uh, transmission lines to some of our neighboring countries. And in this situation, we look at uh, Norway and Sweden, uh, two weeks uh, outage in the situation where we are already stressed. And here we can see that if we don't add any flexibility into the system, then there will be shortages in a few hours of that year. So this is now maybe a year we could see something happening every 100 years or something like that. And then we say, OK. So what, what options do we have in order to ensure the flexibility in these hours? And here we are talking about, um, uh, for example, the transmission lines that, that, uh, that we have in place. We are talking about flexible consumption, dispatchable capacity, and electricity shortage. And uh, what we say is that this can be solved by dispatchable capacity, such as gas turbines, these gas turbines can be run either on natural gas, they can be run on biomethane, or they can be run on, on hydrogen. They are running very, very few hours. So the main issue with these is that we need a low uh, investment cost of these technologies, which are standing still for most of the time, but in a few hours then ramp up in order to deliver. And you are quite right, the cost of the fuel is not so important when we use them for very, very few hours. And the good point is this, is that we calculated that this would cost us around three euro per kilowatt hour in the Danish society. We are currently paying a, a little more than 6.7 euro per kilowatt hour to Energinet to ensure uh, the stability. So the cost is not very high. Uh, so the good point is that we can ensure this uh, stability even with solar and wind and some dispatchable capacity. It doesn't have to be dispatchable, is dispatchable capacity. It could be uh, energy storage. So we brought one example, but many others are coming up, of which some are molten salt. Um, 
and uh, it could also be flexible consumption, which we saw happening a lot last winter, where people showed that they were willing and could move their, their consumption if the price was, was high enough for some hours. So, um, and then the question we were expecting was, let, why not nuclear? So this is not an analysis of the nuclear, it's kind of an explanation, why not nuclear? We were taking uh, as an offset the NSOE 10-year network development plan into to this respect. It does uh, expect an increase in the nuclear in a, in a European context, but not in Denmark. Around 10, 10 gigawatt extra, I think, in the global ambition scenario that we are looking at. So the explanation is kind of uh, then um, why not nuclear in Denmark? Uh, we don't think it's cost competitive in a Danish context, and that is because we have excellent wind resources. We have better resources of wind than most other countries. Uh, so this is, this is the reason why. Um, then there's a high uncertainty in the, in the future uh, costs. This could be for SMR. It's really interesting to follow. Where will this take us? But, but basically, uh, from a European context, we've seen these, these large cost overruns in the, in the projects that have uh, come into reality. SMR, of course, uh, it's really interesting to follow, and we will follow it. Uh, currently, I think there's one plant in, in operation, so there's a lot of uh, uncertainty. Where, where will this end? Some uh, expect it, the price will decrease, and some expect it will increase. Um, per megawatt hour. So the time perspective, uh, of course, is then uh, another issue. We need uh, a lot of uh, uh, green electricity in a very short term. And, uh, and the question is if uh, the nuclear plants can deliver on this. So these are, it's just an explanation. Why does it not feature in our report? But let me uh, convert to, to Jakob, who has some, some more to tell about how we see it in, a, in an energy system context. Yeah, thank you. And um, first of all, I'm not from the uh, Danish Climate Council. I uh, am a researcher at uh, DTU, where I'm a professor in uh, power systems. And uh, I'm one of the co-authors of a document, uh, as you can uh, see here. And that's uh, why I was invited with actually very short notice. Uh, and thank you for the, uh, for the uh, invitation uh, here, here today to come and talk about uh, the, the work we have uh, uh, been doing. Um, <coughs> Uh, and nuclear has uh, naturally emerged as a, a public, in the public uh, debate uh, as a possible uh, solution to the current uh, climate and energy challenge. Uh, and that's, uh, of course, obvious. We have a huge challenge in front of us and we should explore all, all uh, possible uh, options. We also have, ha have a, a long tradition for a democratic and evidence-based uh, debate in uh, Denmark. And uh, uh, I think the nuclear uh, debate until now has lacked uh, uh, more fact. Uh, we should have more facts on the table uh, to be able to have a, a good debate about uh, uh, nuclear in, uh, in Denmark. I think it's especially through uh, true when it uh, comes to discussing the advantages and disadvantages of the nuclear power in the uh, power system. This is a very uh, challenging and uh, complex uh, question which requires scientific methods and scientific uh, models. Uh, and that's also uh, why uh, I and uh, 17 other uh, 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 scientists are working with the uh, uh, power system has taken the initiative to uh, make a report, uh, as you can see here, uh, with the title Input for an Evidence-Based Discussion of the Advantages and Disadvantages of Nuclear Power as Part of the Green transi Transition in, in Denmark. And in this report, you will find a number of analyses uh, about that 
uh, uh, topic. Our aim is to facilitate an evidence-based uh, discussion uh, with focus on facts. So I really welcome the, the debate uh, here, here uh, today. Uh, the report was put forward in uh, October uh, last uh, year, and we invited uh, uh, all stakeholders to provide uh, comments and uh, suggestions for the report, and we also promised to make a new version two, uh, where we uh, address um, these, uh, these comments. And that is actually what we, we have done. We have just uh, released uh, the, the new uh, version of the report, and you will uh, be able to find it uh, online. Uh, we have received uh, many uh, comments, and based on that, we have done various adjustments and extensions of the report in, in the new uh, version uh, two. This uh, table here shows uh, our major, uh, the major uh, comments uh, we have uh, uh, received. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go through all, all these. There's a lot of information uh, available and, and uh, discussed in, in the, the report. My own uh, research area is, uh, is about uh, power system uh, stability. Uh, and we also addressed that in the new uh, report with a full uh, 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 new chapter on the stability of a power system. And we have added uh, uh, that uh, chapter in order to address uh, some of the doubts that there has been uh, whether you can uh, have a stability in a, a fully renewable-based uh, power system. So that is, is what we uh, discuss in, in that uh, uh, chapter. And I would love to, to talk about uh, that uh, and perhaps we, we can have a, some opportunities uh, for that later, but I will actually focus on one of the other uh, central part of, of the new uh, version of this uh, report, and I think it actually fits very well uh, into the content uh, uh, here um, with, with also some of the, uh, uh, the, the concerns uh, raised about how, how the, the, the total energy system uh, 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 and how the, the Danish energy system is seen as part of a larger European system. What about transmission infrastructure and, and so on? So what I would like to, to focus on is uh, this uh, uh, an additional uh, study we have added into the uh, report where we focus on the uh, European uh, energy system and make a total analysis of, of a fully uh, decarbonized uh, European uh, energy system and what is the role uh, of Denmark in, in that. And uh, I hope that will be uh, interesting uh, for you. And Two minutes, ooh, then I have to hurry on. Um, the, um, this is uh, kind of the, uh, the main uh, uh, results from, uh, from that study. Uh, it's uh, complete optimization of the full European energy system with heat, power, transport, industry, and also what is needed uh, of, of grid investments and uh, storage, etc., to make a, a reliable uh, 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 energy system uh, um, in the future. And there's two scenarios. One scenario with a price of nuclear of 6,800 euro per, per kilowatt hour. I'm sure some of you will say that's in the high end. We also uh, have a study uh, where, where we say, okay, now we really uh, to, uh, to try to see what would happen if the cost of nuclear goes to a very low level. 25% of that, 1,700 euro uh, per, per kilowatt uh, hour. So it's a kind of computational uh, example. And what you can see on the left side is that the energy system that, that is uh, uh, optimal in with, with the high uh, uh, price uh, scenario is mainly a wind and solar-based energy system in Europe. The blue and the yellow is wind and, and solar, re respectively. On the right side, with the very low prices of nuclear, it's very natural, nuclear becomes very cost uh, competitive, and a lot of the system will be based on, on, uh, on nuclear. 
What you will also notice is that uh, actually Denmark will not transform, uh, transition into nuclear in that scenario, and, and the southern part of Spain will not transition into nuclear either. They will uh, have uh, a, a bit of sun. And that is simply because the cost of, of wind in Denmark is so low, so it's cost competitive to keep the, uh, the, the, the wind in Denmark and, and similar with the solar in, in, uh, in Sweden. You will also see that there's quite a lot of power to X in both scenarios, that's the, the green color, um, to uh, balance uh, the system. Both systems need the, uh, the power to X to be able to, to balance of, of two different uh, reasons. So, um, uh, so you could say that Denmark uh, is the country in Europe that will need the highest subsidies for nuclear to make it cost competitive uh, with, with renewable energy sources. Um, so finally, then we'll stop. <laughs> uh, the, the new version uh, two of the report is, is uh, out there. So please uh, feel free to, to take a look. It contains uh, uh, 13 uh, key findings, and overall we find that, that for Denmark, uh, nuclear power, power will be more uh, expensive than a system based on, on solar and, and wind. Good. Yes. Thank you very much, Jacob. Thank you. And we will just have uh, time here just for one question to uh, Jakob and Marie up here. And then there will, at the end of the presentations that are coming afterwards, there will be a panel, so they will be up here again also. There's no need actually that you sit up here. You can, mm -hmm. you can stay, but it will take another 20 minutes before the panel starts. So, okay. So one question. What do we have? One quick question, think, please. Yeah. Introduce yourself and a quick question. Michael Fiel Nystrom from Ida Nuclear. I have one question about the prices. Uh, we have just had an arrangement where we have told from Copenhagen Atomics that they think they will be able to produce electricity in Africa for 20 euro per kilowatt hours. So you estimate that you will be able in the future with energy storage to produce a stable price for 20 euro in Denmark as well? Uh, now, I don't have the exact numbers in uh, uh, euro per kilowatt hour. What uh, we have is the total European energy system, and we also have the prices in the, the report. You can, there's a figure where you can also see the prices of the, the various scenarios. We can have one more question. Uh, yeah, we'll have uh, one more question here. Uh, just a fast question. Um, I just read the analysis yesterday uh, when it came out, and what I saw is that the two models that you include, you had the, from the uh, energy plan before, has a lot of other assumptions than the one you use now from Aarhus. For example, the uh, average lifetime of nuclear reactors is 40 years instead of 60 years, and the, uh, the, the calculations and the investment rates are higher. Uh, so there's different assumptions behind the new model. Uh, so it's not only the uh, capital, co capital cost you have changed in the two slides you mentioned there. There's also a lot of other assumptions that is, uh, is changed. Uh, can you say something about why you made those, chose those assumptions? Uh, yeah, I think the, the, the two, I, I'm not completely sure. I didn't do uh, this study that was made by mainly by the uh, people from uh, uh, Aarhus uh, University, so I can't. I don't know all the details. Uh, but the, the 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 two studies are based on uh, different uh, models uh, that that has a, a database of assumptions, and I could guess that. The, what what the, uh, this study uh, takes in uh, a starting point is the uh, kind of the standard scenario of that uh, modeling uh, uh, framework. Uh, so there might be small differences in, uh, but it will not change the uh, the results if you change, for instance, the lifetime from 40 to 60. That that's not the the parameter that will make the difference. Okay. One last question from Lars Reven. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it would be kind of interesting uh, to hear what assumptions you put in for 
conversion cost of p to, uh, p power to x. Uh, often when we debate uh, development of nuclear, uh, it is discarded uh, because uh, we don't have any demonstration mm. of what mm. the actual cost will be. I would make the argument we don't know what power to x will cost. Mm. So how do you square that conversation? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if you know the, uh, the, the numbers for power to x, but the, the situation is that power to x is basically needed to produce green fuels, and that will be what drives uh, a power to x uh, development. Um, and in both these scenarios I showed, power to x will be there, and they are calculated in the same way. And the assumptions are in there for what the cost they, are. Okay. Yes, so, so okay. you have to, I, I, again, I can't, uh, no, I don't remember all the, the detailed numbers but, in my But head. if there are any numbers in there that are missing, you're very welcome to reach out. We, we are trying to, to yeah. participate with facts to the debate, so. Good, and thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and we will have this panel uh, at the end, I mean, just before the lunch break, so where you are, we would like to have you up here. But uh, do you need to leave now, Marie, or? or you'll stay for the panel? I'll leave at 12 exactly. Okay, good. That's noted. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll have the next speaker up now, and uh, that will be uh, Raulin uh, Patzen. Yeah, please. Uh, Rauli is, uh, uh, I, I believe, also the founder of the think tank, no? Yes. Yeah, the, the think tank and the manager of the think tank, and he has advised on many projects around the world uh, related to how to implant this, the SMRs, the small reactors, into other like power plants, like like uh, coal and other power plants. Do we have the? Uh, just make to, make sure, Klaus. Do we have the presentation up here? Hopefully. Okay, thank you. Like I said, uh, already introduced Raul Partan, and I'm honored and excited to be here on this possibly historic day. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about small nuclear reactors and where to use them. Uh, he only introduced me, but, but here's a slide on that again. So I've been writing about energy and climate environment society uh, for more than 10 years now. I was one of the co-founders of Eco-Modernist Society of Finland, which is a pro-science uh, NGO, and also the Replanet Network here in Europe, and uh, co-founder and, and currently lead this non-profit think tank called Think Atom. And that's the URL, the, the web address that you can go and download all the studies that we've made. And here are some of those studies. There are some physical copies there on the side table. So if you are fast, <laughs> you can get your copy and I can sign it if you buy me a beer. <laughs> um, today I'm going to focus a little bit on this small nuclear reactors and where to use them brochure, which I have plenty of copies there. So hopefully everybody who wants one can get one or you can download the, the PDF. Right, let's go to the first part. What do we use when we use energy? This was already a little bit uh, talked about in the previous ones, but it's electricity is just one fifth. We've been using electricity for about a hundred years now, and it's been growing two percentage points per decade. And if we assume that that rate will continue, it will be about 25 percent by 2050. We'll still have 75 percent of other stuff that we mainly burn. So there's transportation, fuels, 25%. These are rough numbers, so don't go exact on these. Uh, and then you have heating, you have space heating, water heating, and industrial process heating, which is about half, maybe a little bit more. This is global. So here... Fjernvarme, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You have Fianvarme, uh, district heating. And this is the European situation on the heat side. So it's about 6,000 
terawatt hours, give or take, that we use as heat. And about half of that is space heating. And about 15% of that half is Tian Wanne. About 40, 450 terawatt hours. And, and Denmark uses about 35 terawatt hours of electricity per year. So that's the scale of these things. Um, so you have hot water and other uses, about 1,000 terawatt hours. And then industrial process heat, which is 2,000 terawatt hours. And there you can see the temperatures that we use those steam steams at. So quite a bit, about 1,000 terawatt hours is steam that is hotter than 500 degrees Celsius. So there's a lot to do besides just electricity. Even though if we would double our rate of electrification, we would still do about 30% by 2050. And there's a lot of these kind of hard to electrify use cases that fuels are simply just a better solution for, for the local condition, whatever that is. Maybe it's a jet airplane that flies long distance flights or, or bunker, fuel, bunker fuel used in, in shipping and, and stuff like that. Let's go to the next part. These are very short parts um, on the, the, the topic of today, SMRs and where to use them. So here's some of the examples of small reactors that have, are being developed. There's actually dozens, I think more than 60 of these uh, under development at the moment globally. I would bet that not all of those will be built there's a lot of very exciting ideas, uh, but I would guess that it would not make sense to build all, all of those prototypes. But uh, some will, and some will get into serial production and realize the kind of gains in efficiency and, and cost reduction through that. So we have the UK SMR Rolls Royce, which Tuomo will talk about later today. Uh, you have the GE Hitachi X300 and a lot more. And as you can note, these can be used for different things. There, is, uh, there are district heating reactors that only produce warm water, about 100 degrees or something like that. So you don't need a turbine to make electricity because you're not making electricity. And you don't need a pressure vessel to keep the water liquid because it's only 100 degrees. Or at least you can do with this kind of Nescafe coffee machine pressures that, that are quite easy to reach. And you have molten salt reactors, you have gas-cooled reactors, all kinds of exciting things that you can use for different things. These things include, so here, it's a bit busy slide. On the upper, you have all uh, di some different industries and what kind of temperatures they use as steam. So you have district heating and, and water desalination, which can use about between 80 to 120 degrees, which you could provide with a water heating reactor that I just talked about, right? You have a pulp mill that's big in Finland. I'm Finnish, so we have a lot of pulp mills there. There's, there's almost no people and a lot of forest. That's 150 degrees to 400 degrees. You have petroleum refineries. And there are some of the exciting stuff high temperature electrolysis and even thermolysis, which are more efficient ways of making hy hydrogen that you need very high temperatures. And here are some of the, in below you have some of the reactor technologies and what kind of temperatures they provide. So these are not kind of, you can, or certainly you can use a higher temperature reactor for a lower temperature purpose, that's easy. But you can also do it the other way. So you can top up the heat if you need 400 degrees for some process and you only get 300 degrees from your reactor, you can top it up with maybe burning a little bit of gas or pressurizing the steam or using electric heating or, or whatever. So there's ways to go, go around that. Yeah, forgot to press the button, button here for the <laughs> all the stuff that I, I talked about. Good. Let's go to the final part. Um, one of the use cases for SMRs, 
which have been talked about quite a lot in the last couple of years is how to repower existing coal, gas and biomass plants. And repowering existing coal plants is the biggest single reduction opportunity that we have. Coal plants alone produce about one third of our only, all of our emissions. And we have about 2,000 gigawatts of coal capacity compared to about 400 gigawatt of nuclear at the moment. And I think the median age for those plants is about 15 years. So they're not going anywhere anytime soon. China has been building a lot of new coal in the last 20 years, and they are young plants. They will be used for 30, 40 years. So it would be great if we could replace the dirty part, the coal, coal boiler, with something much cleaner. What are the issues and benefits? Well, like I said, dozens of possibly suitable reactors are being developed. And first ones will be built during this decade. And we will then enter serial production with some of those in the 2030s and 40s. A repowering coal plant can be done either with a light water reactor or these other types of advanced reactors like a molten salt reactor developed by Copenhagen Atomics and Seaborg here in Denmark. And the key benefit is that you can then reuse the plant infrastructure. And the power grid and the heat network, the Tjernverme, and even the local expertise. And that will lower your cost, which makes it economically viable to not use your coal plant for 40 years or 50 years, but maybe just for 15 years or 20 years, and then repurpose all the other infrastructure and then use it as a nuclear power plant. One of the exciting opportunities here is that in this picture you have the reactors on the background. Those are advanced nuclear reactors, concept building, whatever. And in the foreground you have molten salt storages. So these act as a storage for high quality heat, 600, 700 degrees. It's your solar salt that already got mentioned before that is currently used in concentrated solar plants. Similar to that, or even the same, chemically same, same stuff. So you have this kind of storage between your reactor and your turbine generator creates two exciting possibilities. I'll start with number two, increases the plant's flexibility. So you can run the reactor all the time, but then, you, then you're un, you're, when, when power pr prices go up, you unload your storage and sell the power. And if power pr prices go low, you don't do that and you load your storage. But the reactor keeps running 24 seven all the time, which makes it economically more viable again, because the reactor is the expensive part of the system in, in any nuclear power plant. And then another exciting opportunity there is that it decouples the safety case of the reactor from the turbine island and the district heating island and whatever you are using, maybe industrial heat even. So you have the molten salt in between of those two things, which makes it regulatorily, oh, I don't know if that's a word, <laughs> easier and, and more straightforward to, to license and permit your plant. Okay. As a conclusion, and these are also important benefits for the local situation. You can protect local jobs because their retraining can be done. A person that runs a turbine generator at a coal plant can be retrained to run a turbine generation a generator at a nuclear power plant. You also get to include the current stakeholders. So we always talk about this evil fossil fuel industry. Well, they also happen to have all the money. So it would be beneficial for investments if you could get them included 
in the discussion as part of the solution instead of as the bad enemy that, that, that needs to be destroyed because that's not going to... I mean, it might happen one day when we run out of oil and gas and, and, and coal, but we need to accelerate that, 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 that trend. And if it will also align their interest. They have a stake in the game on the clean energy transition if they are part of it instead of kind of being on the other side. So this can dramatically shift the conversation about and, and with these organizations. And this is already starting to happen. So this is one example I'm using. Last year's COP, uh, Conference of Parties, or so the climate negotiations, uh, the organization called Terra Praxis uh, launched their first online application app, meaning uh, a software for coal plant owners. They can go there, in, insert the, the key characteristics of their coal plant, and they get an easy number and, and feasibility kind of report if it would be if it would make sense to repower their coal plant or not. So they only have to use maybe a week instead of a couple of years and, and, and millions of dollars to do that report. So it makes it really much easier to take that first step and then, then start to do the more detailed studies. It's my last slide. This is my slide on the nuclear sustain sustainability and, and safety. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward for the questions and, and discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Rauli. I, I actually, I think uh, we, we have this, uh, we will drop this short question to you and ask the panel to start now, because then we're also going to make the lunch break in time. So all the previous speakers, if you come up, and uh, we'll take a round of questions from the audience. Uh, wherever you want. You can, you can take my space. Yeah. Do we have solutions? Good, okay, so uh, we have a very powerful panel up here and lots of questions. I'm happy to see anyone that hasn't raised, you had a question before, no? <laughs> no, okay, so who's up here? First question coming here, please introduce yourself. <clears throat> my name is Hans Otto Christensen. I have my own consulting company, but I've been involved in the CO2 emissions for shipping the last 20 years, and I'm deeply involved in that. I think sometimes, People and politicians say, we shall just have more and more windmills. Mm -hmm. We shall have more solar power. But let's come to the more practical thing, because power to X production requires three times more energy, roughly, than the energy in the unit of the power to X mm -hmm. energy. So we therefore need even much more wind energy Yes. <laughs> yeah. Therefore, I would say, how do, will you solve that problem? Because if we look practically on the things, it will cost a lot of hundred thousand of people which have the skill. Have you thought about that in all your examinations? That, I think that is a problem. Maybe, is that a question to the Climate Council, I think? Maria or Jacob? Um, no, so uh, I think I think that that uh, it's a good point that everywhere in the energy system we need people, and and we are as everybody or most people in this room may be aware that that, that there is a, a lack of uh, and, and it was in the radio today that we need uh, we need to make sure that we have enough people uh, mobilized. So of course this is a challenge. I think that is a challenge, would be a challenge for nuclear as well. I think it's a challenge for everybody in the energy sector that we need people. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think, I think we are, we are upscaling production capacities. We are learning this is how it goes in, in, with every technology that once you start uh, implementing something, you learn uh, with time how to do it more efficiently and with less use of manpower. I'll just have a small comment on that as well. Uh, I think it's uh, correct that we have, uh, with all energy technologies, 
have to have people involved in them and there's different challenges. Um, but it's also different jobs that are involved in this and how many people that is has to be involved. And is it full-time jobs and which kind of job, uh, jobs does these technologies provide? And I see it as a difficult task for uh, in the years to come if all of the people working in the wind industry and solar industry, the maintenance jobs are not that high and the, the earnings are not that high, so it's not that favorable for, for these people to work there. So we need to, to, to create stable jobs for these people. Um, and I think that's a big problem with the transition as well. How many people are actually going to have a job in the green transition? Um, and that's also for nuclear as well, um, for power to x wind and solar. Um, and I think it's a, 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 a fact that we, we leave out of the discussion a lot, uh, is actually which kind of potential jobs are there in the future for, for people working in these industries. No, okay, I think it's up to yeah. Yeah, thank you. My name is uh, Joachim Bao. I am a member of the board in the association Nuclear Power, yes please. But then in my career life, I work in the energy trading industry, which I'm sure you've all heard much about lately in the news, so apologies on behalf of that industry, but uh, my question is for you, uh, Marie. Uh, you mentioned that in 10% of the hours in your scenario, we will be uh, relying on importing uh, electricity from our neighboring countries. Uh, how are you estimating the price of uh, those hours where we import electricity? The analysis was done with a model which is called Balmoral. I don't know if you've heard of it before. Uh, EA Energy Analysis applies it. It's been used for many different, um, uh, yeah, many different uh, are buying the services and I work with it in, actually coincidentally in my work. So what it does is that it looks at the, the, the demand for energy in each of the countries which are part of the model. I think it was most of Europe in this particular analysis. It looks at uh, the investment costs and the operation costs and it uh, solves to get a least cost optimization. It takes into account the existing transmission lines and, and uh, the possibility to invest in new. It takes into account the existing uh, plants and the energy resources in the different countries, and then it it uh, it uh, solves um, least cost. Where where should we invest? Who should produce in in uh, each of the hours? So I don't know if this uh, answers your question. Hi, Mary. I'm uh, Richard Ollington from the Radiant Energy Group in the UK where we also have plenty of very cheap offshore wind, just like you guys do here. Um, my main question is to you around the differences between what the UK and Denmark are looking to do. So I see the UK as similar to Denmark in huge offshore wind potential, very cheap levelized cost of electricity, big appetite to do demand side response, energy storage, dispatchability, all similar stuff to what you were saying, but in the UK, we plan on building 25% of our grid based on nuclear. What do you think the, the differences are uh, that I've missed between Denmark and the UK? I had a debate with, about this with a professor from Oxford uh, not too long ago. And um, He's been working with the energy system in UK for many years, including nuclear, and, and he asked uh, a member of parliament, um, and, and the, the conclusion was that this was not for civil purposes. The reason why the build-out of uh, nuclear in, in, um, in UK was his comment, was not for civil purposes. So, so there are other reasons for building nuclear, I'm sorry, this is... Uh, um, we have another system, so let's, let's take his uh, analysis of the situation out and, and add mine. I think that, that um, we have a situation in Denmark where we are, I call it, an uh, um, energy highway. So we are very well connected, and we are very well connected also to, to Norway and to the, to the Norwegian hydropower. Uh, and we do have a very long focus on sector coupling. 
which means that we have other ways of adding flexibility into the system than you have built in. Notably, we have a huge district heating uh, where we can also facilitate the, the, the storage and the flexible consumption and so on. So we have, in some ways, some of the same potentials, but in other ways, quite different situations than you have in the UK. And I think this is one of the reasons why we are choosing different paths. Hi, I'm Christian from Carnival Next in Sweden. Um, and I'm a bit worried when you're saying that you're going to use our energy for import. Um, by 2026 in Sweden, we will have a negative power balance of about 10 gigawatts. Um, so I'm not so sure that we can spare that for, for Denmark at this time. Um, and it, it's... Um, in Sweden, we have this kind of agreement between the parties um, that looks to the total defense of Sweden. Uh, I'm not sure that you have the same thing in Denmark, but in Sweden, we have a goal, uh, or actually it's a requirement now, that we should be self-sufficient or island-operated um, for 90 days during a conflict. Uh, and keeping the same industrial output level as in peacetime. How do Denmark see on those things? I think it's a kind of a relevant question in the political space. Thanks for all the nice questions. I'm uh, apparently a popular person. Um, but... Um, so this report that we said, it's 10% of the hours. It's not necessarily 10% of our total consumption, right? And although we love, we, we love you guys, but you are not our only source, so, so there are other sources. But of course, this is a debate that is worth taking, right? To which extent do we want to rely on uh, our beloved neighbors, and do we trust the Swedish? I mean, they're a bit suspicious sometimes. Uh, do we trust the Norwegians? Do we trust the Europeans? What we can say uh, is that if we try to solve these issues together, we can solve them cheaper. If we each country wants to build a wall around themselves and say, we are going to solve this on our own, then the total cost of the green transition is going to be much higher. So at the moment, at the European level, we have a decision that we want to trade. We want an open market for power. We've been working on this since the last 20, 30 years. Uh, and that's for a reason. That's because the green transition becomes cheaper. But if we each close around ourselves, then we have to have a much more capacity available. Uh, of course, we, this is not the situation you are talking about. You're talking about a few days w during a conflict and so on. And this is, this is the debate actually we're trying to push with this report where we are saying... Um, Marie, sorry, we, for, just for... Because Thank you, thanks. I know that you have been under a lot of fire, but it's just that we, we just need a few we more. I, I think you made a good point there, that, that, that say you have the, the ambition to work on this. So it's just that last had yeah, a question. Yeah, I, I, I found it, the, the comment quite interesting. Uh, are you opening from the, the Climate Council an invitation to collaborate with the Swedes about, because I, I seem to remember last time we had a presentation here that the lowest cost of producing energy is from renovation of existing nuclear power plants. That was Michael mm. Vald Matisen, I think he, he, or Brian Vald Matisen, he, he, he displayed this. So if we were to help the Swedes mm. renovating their nuclear power suites uh, against getting some electricity also, also on, a, on a cold day, or would that be uh, something that you would look positively at? I think we are working with, together with the Swedish all the time. There's a very strong collaboration between our transmission system operators. I don't personally think we would need to invest in Sweden if it is feasible for Sweden to renovate their, their nuclear plants. And then they would sell and buy electricity with us like we do with everybody else in all the, our other surrounding countries. Thank you. So, Thank you. We yeah. need to, yeah. some quick questions before the break. I think Marie has had a lot of questions. Can we distribute the questions? It, it's difficult. I think we should have a separate debate, perhaps, with Marie. <laughs> and, and guess what? Um, I'm going to ask Marie. And um, 
looking at the outlook of reducing to 70% by 2030 is everyone's top of mind for politicians these days. However, the last 30% reduction until 2050 is going to be way harder, I think. So when you say in the report that the time aspect is critical, do you really don't think that 2050 is a pretty good timeline for introducing nuclear power in Denmark? I think that uh, this very much depends back on the cost issue. I think we should try to, to deliver the cheapest uh, green transition that we can. And if at that time uh, nuclear is uh, compatible with the, the other alternatives for a Danish condition, I'm only talking Denmark. I'm not talking outside of Denmark on, on any of these issues, then I think we should definitely look at it. So I, I think we should be open to all technologies that can deliver in a, um, a total socio-economic cost uh, the cheapest solution for the decarbonization. Thank you. Yes, um, my name is Thijs. I'm from uh, Feining Atomkraft Jatak. Um, I would start with a rhetorical question. Um, to the energy modelers in the middle. Sorry that we keep focusing so much on you guys. Um, are you all knowing into the future? I suppose the answer is no. Nobody can completely with 100% predict the future. Johan presented a lot of studies from other countries which have a lot of the same market conditions in terms of power price curves on Nor Norpool but they reach different conclusions in all our neighboring countries, big national reports that show that nuclear has a major role. For example, I think in Sweden, maybe Christian can corroborate, they say that nuclear would constitute 50% of the energy system in 2050. Um, so I'm just wondering why we are discussing in Denmark these future estimates and predictions as something that's certain and why we're not being a little bit more humble and not putting all our eggs in one basket and for example as Re Lars Rebjen said um, collaborating more and seeing if we maybe have some blind spots in Denmark. So what is it that is so different about Danish power prices compared to Swedish because to me they look the same so isn't it the same market and sort of the same challenge after all. Yeah, perhaps I can start then to uh, <laughs> put some of the pressure off, <laughs> Marie. Um, you had quite a number of quest uh, questions packed into, into one. But I think the, the, the big difference is that we in Denmark have really cheap wind available. Uh, and that makes it very fa favorable for Denmark in a connected European system to have the, the wind power in, in, uh, in Denmark. And, uh, the, the, um, and, and I think we, we actually have a lot of collaboration. The, the uh, Euro European power system is interconnected and there's trading taking place every day. Uh, so, so what you will see, that the, also the difference between these various studies is that the study that, that I presented was about Denmark in the European system. It was not, you could say, if you took the same picture and, and, and uh, view it from, from Sweden's uh, point of view, yes, their role will be, if you have these extremely low prices, to focus on, on, uh, on nuclear. So, so it's, uh, in the system, we play different roles to overall make the most cost-optimal uh, energy system. Okay. I hope, just a follow-up, like it is one system because we have so many interconnections in Denmark. Yeah. The prices in south of Sweden and Denmark are almost the same. So it is actually the same system. So can we build nuclear much more cheaply in Sweden? That is like the only logical solution I can no. see here. No, but you have to take the transmission grid into account. So uh, if, if you have areas where you don't have good uh, wind conditions, then all other equal, 
if you have extremely low cost of nuclear, then it will be more favorable to use that technology in that area. So, so it's a balance between transmission capacity and the cost of the various resources in the different regions. Okay, I think uh, we're running out of time, Thomas. Uh, so we have plenty of debate after the break. Yeah, after the break. Yeah, so we'll have a break okay. until 12.30, uh, uh, where there will be sandwiches, uh, coffee, and uh, water outside. So please be back at uh, 12.30, and we will continue. Thank you. Thanks for the panel.
I like. So, uh, it's time to start, uh, and uh, we will start the third part of the symposium now, and I'd like to welcome the CEO of the Swedish company, Kjernfull Next, uh, Christian Schulander, uh, and he's going to tell us about what they're doing in Sweden and how, they're roll how to they plan to roll out nuclear power, including uh, also how the private sector is investing in this. Christian? Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, so I'm Christian, CEO and founder of Carnful Group, uh, and we're talking about Carnful Next here today. Um, so we are a project development company. Um, as we've seen, the wind industry has been heavily influenced by the project developers that take a project from initiation into a fully licensable product and then they sell it off for construction and ownership in the end. And we're doing the same in Sweden. Uh, but let's start first and look at what we've done and why we are here. Uh, Sweden is uh, in a position today, uh, but we were in your position roughly four years ago. Um, no one loved nuclear. Even Sweden with our great legacy of 12 reactors, and we actually invented some of them. We didn't love nuclear. Uh, it was a forgotten product, so to say. Um, today, it has changed tremendously. Um, and in order to buy into this, you know, to have a more factual-based uh, discussion, we started the first business-to-consumer brand in the nuclear space in the world in 2019 an electric, uh, electricity supplier business that provides 100% nuclear power to its uh, users. And we have tens of thousands of users both in Sweden and since 2020 also here in Denmark. Um, so that was always the first step, changing the narrative around nuclear. And when we have that buy-in, the next step, would be actually developing new nuclear projects. And that's why we launched Carnful Next um, roughly a year ago now. Um, and it was modeled based on how the wind in industry had been very, very successful in doing this. We're into de-risking projects to the phase where you actually have a commercial viable product that can be built repeatedly by the same methodology by using the same technology and the same supply chains. So it's not only SMRs standardizing the reactor, it's much more. It's standardizing the delivery of it, it's standardizing the financial model around it, and it's also standardizing the off-takers around this. Uh, we are running multiple projects in Sweden right now, and we aim to have our first reactors online in the early 30s. But, you know, Sweden had its challenges, as I said. You know, we had mountains to climb when we started this, as you do in Denmark, in a way. The public perception was negative. Now it's a positive. Um, one very important thing is that we are now both aligned and allowed to be inside the EU taxonomy, which opened up a vast amount of ESG capital to invest. So when we're looking at different discount rates or cost of capital for nuclear and for wind, it's actually not true anymore. We pull into the same type of capital, and it has to do with de-risking the projects enough 
so we can show the investors the same path of return that they would get from other energy uh, investments. So what about the NIMBY effect? You know, even the public perception is great on a collective level in Sweden. Does it mean that you actually want it in your backyard? And we've done polls on this. This poll is from a year ago, um, almost kind of pre geopolitical conflicts. Um, and it turns out that having an SMR in your municipality is something that is seen very positive upon. Um, we like them because of the socio-economical benefits from it. We're creating you know, highly paid jobs for 60 plus years, and we're creating stable energy sources that actually attracts a lot of different investments in the local community. And we can see by the existing sites in Sweden, we have three, you helped shut one down, so we have three left in Sweden. Um, they love their reactors. Uh, if we ask if you're happy with the reactor in those municipalities, it's roughly 90% that see this as positive. And we've touched on this several times before, but when we talk SMRs and developing nuclear projects, we never talk about electricity. We always talk about energy. Because even though, if we're looking at a BWRX 300, it has a 300 electrical, megawatt electrical effect, but it has almost 900 or 870 megawatt thermal effect. And if we can use all that, today in Sweden, it's considered waste, or actually, it's included in Swedish energy inefficiency, that we actually put it in the, in the water for cooling. But we could take care of that instead. And using that heat, superheated maybe, as Raul mentioned, to make use of high temperature uh, electrolyzers, or we could use it for district heating, for instance. So by tapping into this, we're creating these hubs of um, energy that can be localized. You can create your own communities around them. You do not need to build transmission lines everywhere. You can put them next to off takers, which enables co-generation in a very, very stable fashion. <clears throat> so what makes us different from how nuclear has been developed before? Well, nuclear in the past has been developed as a uh, state enterprise almost. Very, very few projects have been privately driven before. Um, and we, had, we have today um, an ownership and operating structure that is kind of the same entity. The owner of the plant is also the operator and was also the developer of this. And we don't see that as a very, very good thing. We see that they, we, we have several constraints with that. One, uh, we tend to rely on subsidies and feed-ins if state is involved in developing things. And we see this here in Denmark as well. There's a lot of subsidies being pushed in and we don't think that that's a sustainable way going forward. It can work for a few years, but you will have a system that it's not optimized according to the market. And another thing as well, that these state-owned utilities that built these reactors, they put them on the balance sheet. And if we, like in Sweden, will go from you know, 160 terawatt hours produced to 320 terawatt hours produced in 20 years time, with an additional 60 terawatt hours that has to be replaced during that time, there is not a single balance sheet on your, our utilities that can hold that it has to come from other sources. So we are investigating these new financial models on how to leverage more capital in that sense. Uh, we're looking at multiple offtakes, you know, hydrogen, district heating, process heating, and of course electrons to the grid or electrons to the localized grid, which makes a levelized cost of electricity or energy a terrible measure for that because it only accounts for the 
electricity produced, but we produce so much more from it. Uh, instead of relying on subsidies, we write bilateral PPAs with off-takers instead. That's how we make these investments possible. And there's a huge demand for it, both in Sweden, but also throughout the Nordics. We see a lot of this happening in Finland as well, as in Norway. So it's not a localized thing to Sweden. We ha all have to go some, uh, down the same route. We have a global leading expert team um, when it comes to delivery. We've, since we are a product developer, we're tech agnostic, uh, which means that we could potentially develop and build any type of reactor. Today, we think there are very, very few reactors that actually can be built. We have one sitting here uh, that will speak after me today, but there are a handful of them. Then we have a lot of other type of reactors. We like to maybe reference them as PowerPoint reactors sometimes because it's a great idea, but they haven't shown themselves and we haven't licensed any of them yet. So that is an issue. Uh, so our global team of experts has come from all around the world. They have delivered projects before. They've delivered nuclear reactors on time, on budget, elsewhere. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We'll leverage the best the industry knows about this. And the legacy industry, or the current industry, they will have a huge part to play in this going forward as well. If we're gonna have, in Sweden, upwards of 50 new reactors coming online in the next 30, 40 years, there will be a huge challenge to operate them. And we see that our amazing operators, be it Vattenfall or Fortum from Finland, they will have a huge role to play there. They can be part of our, what we call the operator as a service market model, where they don't necessarily need to own the reactor, but they operate it. Ownership can then be transferred to other type of investment vehicles, like sovereign funds, pension funds, or pure debt. Um, by bonds instead. So this is what we do. Initiate projects by looking at a need from a consumer, be it a big industry or a municipality, we work with both. Then we make sure we have all the necessary uh, pieces of the puzzle, so we de-risk the project so much that we can finance the ownership for the next 60 years as a very, very, very low cost of capital. And this is new to the nuclear industry. It has not been done this way before. So we sit in the middle between all different stakeholders. We're the glue that keeps everyone together because industries, they are not good operators for a nuclear power plant. They want to be an off-taker. They want to buy the electricity or buy the heat from us. The municipalities, they are not owners or operators of a power plant either, but they are stakeholders. They will pre provide um, services for us and we will provide them with taxpayers during a very, very long time. We are today working with Fortum on the operating side, we are working with GE Hitachi as a preferred partner on the reactor side, and we have a very good back financial backing by a company called Granter in Sweden that is a social development company. They develop real estate and they manage pretty much all the big plants we have in Sweden, be it refineries or industries. So what about Denmark? And I think this is the question. You know, considering what we've seen today, you know, uh, it looks like pretty much everyone else is looking, going into nuclear. Does Denmark really want to be the one that le uh, is left at the station you know, when the train has passed? Or is it wise to actually start looking into this a bit more? We would be so happy to develop projects in Denmark if the political sentiment proves itself on the trajectory where the public opinion is now, and if the draconic laws surrounding nuclear is abolished, 
of course, we are currently talking with industries in Denmark as well, but we cannot build here. We would like to do so, of course. So why would we for Denmark? Of course, it comes down to this, you know. We've heard so many times today, uh, the marginal cost of a, a kilowatt hours is not a good measure of a total system cost. You need to take into account everything, and that includes opportunity costs of doing nothing as well. I tried to explain before that Sweden has now started looking at the opportunity cost of not being self-reliant during a EU political crisis. That is an opportunity cost that should be internalized into the system cost as well. You cannot only look at an energy-only market. Value-adjusted levelized cost of energy is a better measure. It's not a perfect measure. But it actually takes into account a, a little bit more information, like when you are producing and what price you can capture when you are producing. And our Swedish model, which is vastly bigger than the Danish model, because we are now producing 160 terawatt hours in Sweden. Uh, you're just producing about 35 here, I think. Um, we see that it's, as Thay said before, uh, an optimized system consists of about 50% nuclear. Uh, and if we have such a system, nuclear benefits around, they can capture a price that is 10% more than the average price. Solar is something between minus 20 and minus 27%. Uh, offshore wind is minus 5 to minus 15. Onshore wind is minus 10 to minus 20%. So we see that even if we're looking at the levelized cost of energy, you need to adjust those to get the true value of the project. And of course, we should include the other type of offsets that we have as well. You know, when we're looking at this, we see that we can produce district heating for less than one euro cent per kilowatt hour, but still maintain the same or roughly the same levelized cost of electricity in this. And of course, you know, this is a big, big revenue stream for a nuclear power plant coming forward. Again, we've seen maps. Here's another map. This is the anti-nuclear versus the pro-nuclear map. Um, turns out there's a lot of greens. There, there are not that many reds left that are staunchly anti-nuclear. We have a few. Um, and I think when it comes to the population in Europe, we have a majority of the population that are pro-nuclear in the States now. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm always talking too much. So our proposal for Denmark, of course, we need to set up some form of roundtable discussion that is fact-based and takes experience from Finland and from Denmark. We have over 100 years combined experience of being nuclear nations. Learn from us. Do not reinvent the wheel. We've done so much work that you can catch up on in a really, really quick time. The TSOs, they need to start talking much more together than they have before. We've heard today, I tried to say that we have a deficit of 10 gigawatt at exactly the same time as you have a deficit in Denmark. We will not deliver to you. <laughs> it's, and it's not about we not liking Danish people, it's about we cannot physically deliver. And it will be the same for Finland as well, and Norway. Uh, you have to start looking out for your own, uh, over your own house. And finally, please do not get stuck in subsidies. You know, it will be kind of worked into the system in a way. And it's not only the apparent subsidies that we see that uh, the TSO or the state gives. It's also subsidies in the supply chain. You know, you need to make sure that every single piece of the puzzle make a return on their investment as well. Otherwise, it's not sustainable. You can't have wind parks that don't earn money. You can't have the supply chain in the wind industry that doesn't make money. That's not sustainable. 
Thanks. Thank you. And questions. <laughs> I think, yeah, hey, no, no, no. Uh, Christian, Christian, I, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, the I'm reason sure. I didn't stop you because it was so relevant, <laughs> but you went into the, your little five minutes question, but you, we will all have a possibility to ask questions to Christian in the panel at the end. Yeah, please, you'll be there. Good. Okay, so uh, we'll go on to the next speaker, and this is uh, Tormo Hutenen from uh, Rolls Royce, and uh, don't confuse it with the cars. Though you will maybe feel that you have a Rolls Royce when they start delivering electricity to you. But uh, uh, Tuomo will tell us about the plans of Rolls Royce and uh, what they can do with the small reactors. Thank you. Very good. Works. Yeah, we, need, we need to. It works, and yeah, we need to get your. This one moving here. The presentation as well. <laughs> Once we get that, uh, get that sorted, I wanted to ask a question. What's wrong with nuclear power? What have we been discussing here all day? What, what is the issue? It's cost. It's not safety. It's not waste disposal. It's not accidents. It's not proliferation. Cost. Everything comes down cost. I, I have to say that Christian does excellent presentation. I agree pretty much on every single point uh, that you have there. Uh, takes me nicely, uh, nicely to mind. <coughs> Speaking of cost, uh, when Rolls-Royce decided to go into commercial nuclear power, we have been doing nuclear for more than 60 years. More than 100 SMRs, you could say, uh, delivered. Zero accidents. When we decided to go uh, commercial on this, instead of a submarine reactor, this was the deriving factor, the philosophy behind the design. Is first and foremost is cost. If you don't achieve a business case, you need to drop that investment immediately. Because it's just going to... Uh, be a waste of money. Everything comes down to this. You have to be proliferation res resistant. You have to prove your safety. You have to have public and political acceptance, etc. Those are sort of surrounding factors around nuclear. But if I go in to a customer and say that it costs this and this much, or to an investor and says the, uh, the final cost of the product is this much, that is what they care about, and can you deliver? But what's the reason behind the, the rising, or not rising, but too high costs of nuclear in, in the West for the past 20 years or so? I would say that there's two. Uh, one of them is minor, and the second is major. The minor cost is some in inefficiency in the supply chain. Some of the components, for example, are ridiculously expensive. Doesn't make any sense. But the second reason why nuclear is so, so expensive, look at Hinkley Point C in the UK. And it's the cost of money. But the main reason behind all of that coming together is, is the schedule overruns. Driving into that factor of you, you having to pay one, more than 100 euros per megawatt hour for uh, nuclear electricity for example, from HPC. So, but what causes the schedule overrun? You know, why are projects so delayed? And now we have an, a multitude of reasons. Some of them are related more to licensing uh, processes. Their fault can be uh, found on the supplier side, on the developer side, sometimes on the regulator side. Oh, don't say that I said that there's anything wrong with the regulator though. But the, but the main problem be, be, behind that sort of cost overrun is, is the cost of money. When you look at Hinkley Point C, 70% of the final cost of, of electricity is actually the cost of money. It's interest rate, the cost of capital. It's a quite uh, 
proposition to invest something like 20, more than 20 billion euros and then wait 10 to 15 years before you get a revenue stream back. It is extremely sensitive to the cost of capital. If you go from 4% to 7%, all right, that's, the project is killed. So you have to solve that question first. You have to deliver faster. And that's why the philosophy of how to get the low cost is delivery with Rolls-Royce. It's, it's not that we have something extremely innovative from a technology point of view. I could even say that it's really boring. It's a pressurized water reactor. We've seen them so many times over. It's the most common type in, in, in the world. But that's actually what the investors really like. And more than anything, that's what the regulators love. That it's something that they know already. There's nothing wrong with the basic reactor technology. And I could actually say to Rauli that the reactor circuit is only about 25% of the total cost of an entire nuclear power plant. The most of the cost comes from actually the delivery, construction, taking that delivery risk. And that, that's where most of it comes from. So coming, comparing uh, uh, investability, in a sense, is if you invest 2.5 billion euros for four years, it's a very, very different proposition to investing that 20 billion euros or 10 billion euros for 10 to, 10 to 15 years. It's a lot, lot less uh, sensitive to the cost of capital, uh, and it's a lot more deliverable. Uh, in terms of some basic facts from the Rolls-Royce uh, reactor, thanks again, by the way, Christian, for uh, nodding in terms of delivery capability. Is it's the largest of the, of the SMRs, 470 megawatts. Two reasons behind this. We realized that if we increase the, the reactor size from about 300, which is a very, let's say, a popular size, to 470, you get an increased cost, but, but compared to getting 50% more power, the cost is very minimal. Second is that it's, it, the size of the reactor, physical size of the reactor remains so that it's road transportable in all of Europe, which was a design sort of uh, limitation for us, that it needs to be delivered on a standard truck, uh, or more or less a standard truck in, in all of Europe, instead of uh, requiring any, anything specialized. Uh, in terms of delivery, we're looking at early 2030s. Sorry, we are not promising 2028, 2029. We have done a lot of modeling uh, on this. We believe it cannot be done that quickly. As the licensing processes, the operator training, the deployment, everything, we don't want to overpromise here. Nuclear industry doesn't have a great track record here uh, in, in this sense. Uh, we, we don't want to uh, fall into that trap. Uh, quickly going, uh, uh, forward from this slide is what does it cost? It's about 2.4 billion euros per unit uh, with four, 470 uh, net output in a base scenario, which is uh, electricity only to the grid, which I agree again. This is uh, not a scenario that pretty much any of our customers are looking at. I think they're, they have been either talking to this guy or they think uh, very much alike that you get multiple revenue streams. You get power to the grid, power and heat to an industrial customer. Hydrogen, again, through solid oxide electrolyzer, uh, which gets the benefit from the heat. And it, then you get, for example, district heating. And then you can adjust between all of these outputs based on market situation. When the, when the cost of power is like close to zero, it makes more sense to put all of that heat in the, into the uh, solid oxides or uh, district heating wherever else. But for example, last winter, the, the TSO, the transmission system operator in, in Finland, I think they paid something like 5,000 euros per megawatt hour of uh, delivered electricity to the grid when the situation was like extremely difficult. So you, you, so you can actually increase your power uh, to the grid and keep your nuclear reactor running at 100% uh, power to get that efficiency that has been uh, spoken of. The cost of power, if you want to take the LCOE as, as a measure, is uh, 50 to 70 euros per megawatt hour in industry terms, so 5 to 7 cents per uh, euro cents per uh, kilowatt hour. 
what drives that is still mainly the cost of capital. Two and a half billion euros still uh, quite a bit of money. So if you have, if you can access financing with about three or four percent, you're closer to 50. If you're closer to 10 percent, then you're closer to 70 in terms of the final cost. Again, for electricity only scenario, which is not uh, realistic. Uh, I touched upon this already. Uh, what is so, so great about nuclear? It is basically the only existing source of CO2 free or very low carbon heat in the correct heat range as well. You get heat pumps, etc., cetera, or, or um, data centers. You, get, you can get maybe something like 100 degrees. Uh, but with a nuclear reactor, you you're looking at 250 to 300, which you can then trim heat with a very small amount of electricity, for example, for hydrogen production. So this is the immense benefit that we have, uh, have for nuclear. It's, to be honest, this is not just the case for Rolls-Royce. This is basically for, uh, for all nuclear we have this benefit. So in terms of hydrogen production, which is, of course, uh, a lot of attention is going towards using electrolyzers, using very low-cost renewable energy, which is one approach. But what we have found that when we combine two things, first is the capacity factory with nuclear, where we are at about 90 to 95 percent. I think, <coughs> who came up with that 85 percent? That is abysmal. 95 percent is where you can, you know, sort of pat yourself in the back. So instead of Renewable, you get 95% all, uh, all of the time. Actually, every second year, you get 100%, but that's not a topic, but let's say 95%. So you combine that with a completely different technology in terms of producing hydrogen, a lot more efficient technology because you can utilize that heat. And that's called what Christian said, solid oxide electrolyzers, where we can achieve more than 90% efficiency to get this power to liquids uh, a lot more efficient. So you combine these two, and what we found that we are, now I can comfortably say that extremely competitive in the hydrogen market. And this is actually what basically all of our main customers are interested uh, as well. So that's, you could say that hydrogen is a bigger driver than electricity for us. Now I said that our reactor is boring. In most ways it is. So what we are, what are, What's the catch? What are we doing differently? And it's right here on this slide. This is the innovation. This is what's different about Rolls-Royce. It is all focused on the delivery, which then will achieve that low cost. And how do we do this? We do this the same way we, we Rolls-Royce have been doing, uh, for example, in aerospace for decades already, is to move from the stick build on site that, that 10, 15 year of construction, you shift that into factories. And not just the reactor circuit or some parts of the power station, almost every single thing is now done in modules in factories. We have three different sets, primary modules, which are the heavy ones, for example, the reactor itself. Then you have the MEP modules, which is short for mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. We have uh, uh, hundreds of those inside the power plant. You could say these are the uh, make, make the big volume. These are the Lego bricks that, that put together the uh, power station. And then you have the non-nuclear side, civil modules, concrete blocks, etc. something that is sort of proven uh, in a sense. And then on site, you have the site assembly facility, which is basically to cover up the the assembly site, we don't even call it construction site, but, but assembly site, where you put those mo uh, pre-tested modules together, and that is covered by this reusable uh, factory, which has internal cranes in it, so you don't have to book those huge cranes that only a handful exist in, in the whole world. So this is where the efficiency comes from. We know how to do this. We know how to set up factories. We know how to run them. We know quality control. We know safety. We know quality assurance. Everything we are bringing in-house. So instead of relying on the supply chain, somebody else of doing it, we, we are bringing it more in-house to bring more delivery certainty. Of course, we rely on some supply chain partners. 
here uh, for the uh, a bit more in terms of the schedule uh, is that we're looking at early 2030s for the first plants uh, that would be in the United Kingdom. And the benefit there is that we only have to do first of a kind once because e everything is the same uh, when it's done in those uh, module factories. And that's why we are also focusing a lot on pre-licensing with select customers and select reg regulators to, uh, to make sure that all of the modules are, are the same regardless of the country, regardless of the site that they are uh, delivered. So that's what we, uh, what we do different. All right. Last slide. That's, <laughs> that's, that's the last slide, yeah. Okay. Good. Yes, so we have this uh, so-called short questions now uh, to uh, Tomo, so that uh, we can probably make two, and then we will move on to the next speaker afterwards. So any questions for Tuomo? People are tired after lunch. There's one question there. Yes. Yeah. One question is about, uh, I'm Torbjörn Jacobsen from uh, Liberal Alliance, the, the arranging party here. Uh, I want to know what kind of personnel you would need to run such a facility. Personality? Yeah, the, no, the, the personnel needed. Oh, yes. To run the facility. What did, did I say it wrong? I might have. Personalities. <laughs> I thought that I was about to step on a mine in terms of answering that first question. Uh, let's say you walk into this, uh, into this site which has a single reactor instead of uh, several. It gets some benefits, but for the sake of simplicity, a single reactor on, on site, uh, on a given day, it's about 100 to 120 personnel in total. But in terms of operators, if you ask that, it is three, three people exactly per, per unit. So there's the shift supervisor, there's the turbine uh, operator, and there's the reactor operator. How many ships? Three, of course. Yeah. For, uh, there's a lot of things, for example, uh, uh, site security, which needs to be taken care of. Uh, there needs to be fire response, etc., etc. That's actually one challenge in terms of if you uh, go very low in terms of power output, you have this fixed cost that you, uh, and, and requirements that you need to meet in terms of the site. So if you have 50 megawatts of power, and you have a lot of fixed costs uh, around that. So that is a problem, but not, not for us. Any more questions? If there aren't any questions, I would like yeah. to ask Tuomo, because that was something, something I was thinking about earlier, where we heard about England having 25% not for civil purposes of nuclear Can you help us with that? Yeah, originally the, some of the nuclear uh, industry when it was born in, in the 40s and 50s, uh, both in France, both in, uh, in, uh, in, in the UK, uh, also in Sweden, uh, where a lot of that was weapons derived. So in, you wanted to uh, design a reactor that you can produce pluton plutonium with for nuclear weapons. Not the best heritage, to be honest, <laughs> but the current uh, light water reactor designs are not designs and they're not used for that purpose. So I would say that that's a, a bit of a misleading argument in, in that sense. Yeah, I, I remember you said when, when uh, we talked about your presentation, you said that actually those SMRs, the grade of the uranium is much, much, much lower than, yeah. than in the military industry exactly for that perfect purpose, and, and it, it, you use this word uh, profileration, and I'm not sure every day understands that word, but it basically means that if you have a too high grade of uranium in your factory, there's a risk that somebody steals it and make an atomic bomb. And that's what you say, that's, you are, yeah, and there's no the, profileration risk with your uh, reactors. You need to use low enriched uranium yeah. instead of highly enriched, which is used, for example, in some weapons programs or in submarine reactors as well, to achieve, like, you don't have to refuel for 20 years or 30 years or whatever. Mm -hmm. But you need to go, you need to stay below 5% in terms yeah. of enrichment. We are very, very traditional, very conservative <laughs> in that regard. If you go beyond 5%, you're in, you have an enormous nightmare in mm. terms of proliferation. Yeah. You cannot cr cross borders and everything yeah. becomes difficult. Good. Okay, good. Thank, Thank you very you. much. <laughs> and this is, yeah.
Okay, so thank you very much. And uh, our next speaker is Stefan Frölan. He's uh, now, I hope I give it the right time. He's of course Liberal Alliance, the party here in, that is, has been supporting the project. And he's also, re let's say, responsible for, can you say for energy? Yeah, sure. Okay, so Stefan, please. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and uh, thanks to Kim and to Thomas for arranging uh, today. I think that's, uh, it's been a very great event. Uh, thanks to all the speakers before me, and not at least to all of you for showing up. I think it's really important, and it's been very inspirational for myself. And it's just been another uh, bump on the on the road towards uh, getting a better debate about nuclear in, in Denmark. So I think that's been very, very great. Nuclear power is a must to fight climate change. There's no doubt about that. IPCC says it's a must. It's a must. UNECE says the same, and the International Energy Association is very clear about this as well. If we want to keep the world's long-term temperature below one and a half degree, uh, the target we have, in what they call the middle of the road scenario, which is basically a future where we can keep our continued economic growth and our quality of life in, in, in a way where we, in a path where we continue to grow it, then it's a six-fold increase in nuclear that's required. That's from those associations. Then we know that the International Energy Association made a claim that if you want to go on a path to net neutrality, it can be done, but you would have to reduce our growth and our economic viability on the way. And that would still require a doubling on nuclear energy, as we saw earlier. So it's something that's really important. It's something that will help us fight climate change, and it's something that needs better focus also in Denmark. We know that the countries that have earliest and fastest reduced their CO2 emissions and decoupled their growth and emissions have all been nuclear countries. We are looking at Sweden and France and Switzerland as the first three to achieve that. There are other paths to that, for sure. We have decoupled a bit in Denmark, but we know for a fact that the nuclear path is a working path. It's a path without many unknowns but the other paths, the paths only consisting of renewables, are not proven. They are much more high risk, and that's what is feeding all these requirements for the analysis that's continually being made. I obviously welcome all the analysis being made, for sure, but it's an artifact of the system that we're trying to design being uncertain. So what role should Denmark play in this? I think that's the big question, and that's obviously why we're assembled today, mainly. It's true that we have a very, very great and strong competitive advantage in Denmark when it comes to our wind industry. We have the natural resources of wind around us. We also have a high degree of path dependency, meaning that we have already now stepped in that direction for many years. So I don't think any of us are really suggesting that we should shut off that path of renewables or wind energy. It's a strong thing for Denmark to continue. We have just now in the parliament agreed on a huge deal where we're going to put up up to 14 gigawatts of offshore wind in different places around Denmark and connect it to the grid in Germany uh, mainly. All that is good stuff. It's helping with green energy and that's what we want an abundance of. But it's also true that Denmark has a strong history of science and research, and not least Niels Bohr himself. We also have a self-proclaimed leading role in the green transition. We have an extremely ambitious startup uh, environment with Seaborg and Copenhagen Atomics. And the current state of affairs is a very supportive population, a series of apathic political parties, to be honest and a very puzzling correlation between your political wing affiliation and your views on nuclear, which is still something that I can't really figure out why is. And we have a public debate which has been for a very long time characterized best by trench warfare. And I think that is a situation where I would like to get that to be better, much better. Events like today is definitely helping that, that's for sure. 
the public debate is moving in a direction where it's not a hot button topic in the same sense. We can have uh, political and technological discussions about what's right and wrong, and I think that is something that will help bring everything forward. I don't think that the decisions and the results need to be given beforehand. So anything that can resemble the scientific method is something that I welcome warmly. The population is very supportive, and if you ask them, as we saw on the slides, if they would like to see a nuclear power plant in Denmark at some point, they will vote yes if you ask them today. But it's more interesting to look at what is actually going on if you ask them what party do you also vote for. And it's very, very odd to me that some of the people who are the biggest speakers and proponents of helping the green transition move forward fastest are also some of the harshest uh, critiques, critiques of uh, nuclear power. It's, it's, bit, it's a bit puzzling, to be honest, and I would like to break that discussion free from political affiliations. And obviously, being, being a, a libertarian liberal myself, I think it's very welcome that we remove the ban that we have. We should let the technologies compete fairly. I think all the great analysis being done should help inform those decisions, but in the end, if it's a private investment decision that they want to take that risk, then why stop it? Uh, obviously regulated in a sense that we, we just talked about the proliferation stuff and all the security affairs and all that should be done, but don't have a ban on it. Let's at least remove the ban. I also strongly oppose pick the winners as a method, but equally strongly I oppose pick the losers, and that's what Denmark has been doing for 40 years. We have said everything is okay, but not that technology, and I think that's a huge mistake that we need to rectify as fast as we possibly can. It should not be the special interests or the politicians making those decisions. It should be based on calculus and clever investment decisions, not anything else. I also think we should make it possible to build reactors for research purposes or for startups that they can test their, their new technologies on. Uh, we've had such a facility in Denmark until uh, quite recently in our history, and then we shut that down. And I don't know why we shut that down. It was before my time in politics, but maybe that should be opened up. Maybe we should do something else. Maybe it should be easier to do stuff like that so we don't have a complete ban on that. Uh, recently, the ministry was asked how it if it was possible to put up a private reactor in any way, shape, or form in Denmark. And I can tell you that the conclusion was a very, very clear no. And to, to, to the ministry's... Uh, uh, what's it called, to, to, to their honor, I would say they answered quite specifically. So, and not, that's not typical of them. Um, I would also say that we should definitely learn from our neighboring countries. I think Sweden has been, as you say, uh, four years ahead of us. At least you even have uh, established nuclear competencies and we don't have that at all. So instead of inventing the wheel from the beginning, we should uh, see if we can piggyback on, on Sweden's experiences and other countries' experiences for sure. Uh, maybe even leapfrog them if we can. That's, uh, that's a possibility, I would say. And uh, finally, I would like to applaud uh, the Novo Nordisk Foundation. I don't see Lars here anymore, but I think it's been such a blessing in the Danish debate to have a private initiative of a piggy bank of a lot of money looking into this area and saying, yes, we should try to make ourselves a better country for nuclear research at least to see where that takes us. And that is an international perspective I see in other countries when we look around. I know that Norway have just had the similar debates as we have in Denmark. They've had a, their version of a Niels Bohr commission, which is a commission that I suggested to our parliament. They've had that for a vote as well. They turned it down, unfortunately, as did the Danish parliament for my uh, proposal here, but they are going the same direction. They've, it wasn't a private initiative, but they also put 200 million Norwegian kroners to a similar thing as Novo Nordisk have done privately to increase the knowledge level in their society, basically. And I think that's what we need to go through and will go through. So that's really great. So with that, I would just like to extend my thanks, especially to, to Kim and to Thomas, and to all of you uh, for commenting and listening to the nuclear debate. Thank, thank you very much, Stefan. And uh, yes, stay up here for the panel. Uh, for the questions and answers, uh, questions to the panel, please, the, everyone that was in the last round, come up and sit. Yeah, maybe it's the best you sit over here. Yes.
Yes. Okay, uh, we are ready for another round of questions. Uh, Thomas, are you ready with the microphone? Yes, I am. Okay, good. I think we can already see questions coming up down there. There's several questions. Um, actually, I'll start with you because you didn't get to ask your questions the last time, I think, it was. Uh, thank you so much. Um, this is a question mostly for the Climate Council representatives, but anyone on the panel is welcome to uh, give their thoughts on it. Um, I'm wondering, since the problem we're discussing is such a global one, um, and as Marie also said earlier, it's not a problem that we can solve by looking only at our own uh, individual national consumption of energy, um, why is the argument that you're presenting against nuclear enemy uh, uh, energy is that Denmark doesn't need it for our own needs. Uh, why not look at how Denmark might be able to help alleviate this problem on a larger scale than our own consumption through, for example, uh, exporting excess nuclear energy, um, especially since we represent such a minimal fraction of the global issue? Anybody wants to take that? I like yeah. speaking, so I won't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think you're right. I think the problem both in Sweden and Denmark today is that we're looking at a pathway to re you know, electrification of our current industries. We're not looking for new markets that we can build a new industrial era on. Um, the pathway in Sweden says 320 terawatt hours, but that's just converting our old uh, industry to be electrified. We're not talking attracting new companies and new investments to Sweden. If we were to do that as well, we would probably add hundreds of terawatt hours. And Denmark could do that as well. You know, look at Germany and what they're doing in hydrogen, for instance, you know, their uh, Canadian agreement where they're gonna ship ammonia from uh, Canada or Nova Scotia and use it for heating and electrical purposes in Germany, that has a round-trip efficiency of maximum 17%. It's a bad idea. It would be so much wiser to produce it in Denmark and have a pipeline going to Germany for that sake. You would increase that by several hundred percent the efficiency of that and benefit Denmark. Thank you. And now there are three here. I think we'll start with you. Hi, my name is Morten. Uh, I'm a master student from uh, DTU. And my question is for Christian Schulander uh, from Shanful. So you were uh, suggesting that uh, Shanful could uh, possibly build uh, nuclear power stations in Denmark. So we hear this a lot about uh, it's, a, it's very different to build nuclear power stations in Denmark. So from your perspective, what would be the difference from building in Sweden and in Denmark? Well, I can see Sweden from here. So geographically, it's not that big of a difference. Uh, you have the same transmission system as we do in Sweden. We're part of the same energy market. Um, we kind of even understand each other when we speak our native language. So it's draconian laws. We've had them in Sweden as well. We've taken them away rather recently. In the, uh, in the last 15 years, we've taken them away. Um, we don't see it as a problem. Our companies, they don't s see the borders as borders. You know, the industries in Denmark, they have industries in Sweden as well and vice versa. It's the same type of customers. So this is a political thing. Uh, and it has to be resolved because now it adds a lot of risk to any projects. And as long as that risk is there, I can't finance it. That's the issue. If that's taken away, I'm happy to come here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jens. I'm from the Move and Nuclear Power. Yes, please. I have a question for you, Mr. Tuomo from Rolls Royce. Are you confident that we can get the necessary amounts of nuclear fuel for all these new reactors? I've been hearing a lot of talk about uranium shortages and stuff like that and enrichment problems. And if yes, are you also involved in this uh, fuel supply in some way? Yes and no. Uh, first is, uh, 
yes, we think we we don't think uh, that of as a as a ma major issue. Uh, and second, no, we are not a fuel supplier. We design the reactor to me to use standard industry fuel that is otherwise exactly the same that is used in other pressurized water reactors today. Uh, only difference is that fuel element is shorter because we have we don't use we don't have like a thousand megawatts, but 470 uh, instead. The uh, abundance of nuclear uh, of uranium at the moment is not a, not a big issue. Uh, I would say uh, in terms of closing the fuel cycle, uh, that will come in the next stage. I would say also uh, along with some let's say advanced. Uh, nuclear technologies, which we also actually looked at when we decided to go from defense nuclear to commercial nuclear, is to look at the, dif uh, the different available technologies available, be it sodium-cooled uh, reactors, breeder reactors, uh, high temperature gas, molten salt, et cetera, et cetera, and came back that <coughs> pressurized water makes by far the most, uh, the best business case. Boiling water is almost as good. Can I disagree a bit? Yeah. <laughs> a quick disagreement from me. Uh, compared to the need of new nuclear, I'm, I mean, I don't know where that 20 giga gigawatts of new nuclear per year came, but I would add a zero to that as the actual kind of climate progress pathway. And when you start to talk about that amount of new nuclear per year, you certainly will start to see some bottlenecks on the delivery chain. The good thing is that these projects are decided 10, 15 years before they kind of get built, operational. Uh, obviously, we want to make that faster. But for sure, this is something that we should pay attention to. The market will do, do that by increasing the par prices when there's scarcity. But I mean, I, I don't know why, but some people ask me questions on, on, on Twitter with private messages, what do I think about the, the uranium market because they are investing in that. <laughs> yeah. Can I just add a quick note to that? As yeah, well? very quick. Yeah, I mean, as Rowley said, the market will solve this for us. We, have, we don't have a shortage of uranium in the world. And the amount of operational costs of the, uh, of the fuel of a nuclear power plant is really, really small. If we uh, increase the price 100%, it won't affect our LCOE that much, but it will put a lot more mines into the commercial zone. So it's not a problem, and if we triple it, we can extract it from the sea. And we still have a competitive product. So. Yes, with the current deposits that are today, yeah, we have a constraint of a couple of hundred years, but in the future, it's a non-issue. Okay, thank you, Christian. And the next question? Yes, thank you. I'm Frederick from uh, the Association Nuclear Power. Yes, please. It's a question for you, Christian. Is there any obvious reason as to why uh, no company has done what you intend to do yet? Um, you have to understand where nuclear comes from. It comes from engineers. Uh, and the engineers are really, really good at creating reactors uh, and uh, peripherals around the reactor. They are not expert in financial models. They're not experts in business development. And I think this is where we excel. I come from a deep finance background. I've financed a lot of big projects before, and I see how we should wrap this in a financial model to suit the investors. It can't be the opposite way around. So that's where we kind of make our dent in the market, is actually make these marvel of engineer, engineering um, achievements possible to actually be built. Um, and I think it requires a certain skill set, to be honest. Okay, I think we've got three three people. Okay, that makes it four. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hello, 
Uh, I just wrote my question. <laughs> Hello, I am from Korea, and I'm a business intern working for a SMR company called Seaboard. And I have a question about public acceptance. In Korea, public acceptance has been a still going on challenge and has been a big challenge for nuclear power. And recently, Korea is having a debate about Fukushima waste release in the ocean. And public acceptance in Korea is not doing a good job of convincing the Korean people. I have read up plenty of Korean perspective in Korean press and every news materials. In other perspective, especially Mr. Stephen, since you're working at the Danish parliament, uh, what kind of strategy should the private and public sector take into account to overcome these challenges? And also I have another question for Mr. Cho. And do you think SMR have easier chance in gaining positive public acceptance in these areas? Yes, let me uh, kick off those two questions. Excellent questions. And as you could see on the slides, there's been a very big and very fast and rapid change in the public acceptance in Denmark at least. And I think that's more or less a global phenomenon for many different reasons. Um, I think one of the underlying things here is the fear of the unknown. And the more we talk about it, the less the unknown becomes. And I've, I, I can follow the debate in Japan around Fukushima, and that's also a very big change. They are now reopening their nuclear programs. They've had one of the biggest accidents. They're investing again. Ukraine, which probably has, well, has the worst nuclear accident and now also a threat to their nuclear power plants, have also invested again in buying more SMR reactors for their own grid. So the countries that have the problems, the nearest to them are the least afraid. And I think that's just proving the point. And to uh, add on for the public opinion aspect of, from the, yeah, of course the public, I would say that um, what has happened in Denmark is a bunch of multiple factors, for example, the climate crisis and also the energy crisis but also for our organization, Forening Atomkraft to mobilize a lot of young people uh, and people of all ages to, to actually uh, speak up against this, because we know that there's a lot of people supporting nuclear and Denmark, as we can see on the opinion polls. But giving them a area and giving them a, a, a voice where they can actually speak about this to, to get together and talk about these point of views, that's a big mobilizing factor we have experienced. And for other countries to learn from this is to, to try to, to create a, a story about nuclear. And nuclear not being this evil technology that will f end up in a catastrophe, but being nuclear actually providing green, re green reliable electricity for many generations for our grandchildren and helping us decarbonize with wind and solar. And a lot of pro-nuclear advocates get stuck in the, the notation that it's only nuclear versus wind and solar, and also on the other side that it's no nuclear and only wind and solar. We have to get together and talk about all the solutions. And if we do this, it seems much more appealing to a broader population and not that polarized where debates will occur and, and people will get mad at each other. So sitting together and talking about it solves a lot of problems. Usually. Thank you, Johan. And, uh... Uh, and a quick answer to the, does SMR have a benefit in terms of public perception? Not, I'm not saying this from a Rolls-Royce perspective now. Been in nuclear for a long time. I uh, say yes. And the key there is uh, that it enables uh, an escape route for the anti-nuclear lobby. This happened about five years ago in Finland when the Green Party, traditionally very anti-nuclear, started shifting their opinion. And many people there said, okay, we dislike this traditional large nuclear, uh, big intimidating projects, cost overruns, et cetera, et cetera, but we like these SMRs. SMRs are cool, uh, that's hip, I like that. Even though previously they, they were against nuclear for various reasons, for example, again, proliferation, accidents, uh, cost, et cetera, et cetera, those are pretty much all the same in SMRs as they are with not, uh, large nuclear. We have a lot of the same benefits uh, as well. But it, it gives them, especially the politicians, it gives them uh, an ability to save face. Given that I'm the nuclear communications professional in the room, I'd, I'd like to answer as well. <laughs> what Tuomo said is, is, is correct. This has offered 
a new chance for people to look into nuclear. I, and I think so far, given that we have very few SMRs running, that's the main value that SMRs have been providing for society <laughs> so far. I hope that there will be other stuff as well. The thing is that if nuclear engineers don't understand financial stuff, they surely don't understand communications. <laughs> and they've been doing that for 45 years now, leading with stuff like safety first, which is an internal culture that they have, and I'm really glad that they have that. But it's a terrible thing to enforce to the unsuspecting population that you only talk about the safety and safety and safety because that makes people afraid. And then you assume that you give them numbers, people accept them and change their minds. This, this kind of information deficit fit communications model that you assume that there is a lack of information and then you just pour data into it and it fixes the whole thing. But that's now how humans work. We need emotions and, and we need shared values and all of that stuff. And as long as the nuclear engineers have been running the communications departments in the nuclear companies, it's been a horrible, horrible result. Uh, so that needs to change. Yeah, and yeah, I'm trying to do that for my part. Well, we have uh, another question here. This gentleman has been waiting for three and a half hours to, to put, place his question. Yeah, thank you very much. It's not so much a, a question, it's more maybe a reflection or, or a comment on some food for thought. I am Jesper Olsen, I'm from the shipping company uh, DFDS, and uh, we operate around uh, 65 uh, ships. And uh, we also need to uh, decarbonize, of course, and for that purpose, we need uh, green fuels produced by, for example, Power 2X. And we have made a small calculation estimating how much power we actually need to get the fuel for our limited number of ships. And we need actually around 4 gigawatt uh, of uh, wind farm power running constantly, only producing fuel for our 65 ships. And then you can count and say, okay, there is between 60 and 70,000 commercial vessels in, in the world. We have aviation, we have road transport, industries, et etc. et cetera. So it, it's more to say that um, we need all hands on deck, we need all energy sources on deck, and uh, we strongly believe that nuclear power also have a role to play here in combination with wind and solar. Thank you. Great comment. This is exactly why I told that we need to add one zero to the 20 gigawatts. You're just one company and you could eat up all the wind yeah. farms we have in Finland. Yeah. And the next question? Michael Field Nystrøm from Ida Eklund Nuclear, and I'm an engineer as well with CO2 neutral energy as a specialty. First of all, if you want to have windmill runs constantly, you will have an issue. And, um, and then um, what I meet when I talk to people about what the first thing that presents to me, uh, the first issue is that we need some education within this area. It's very fine that we want, some of us want some nuclear power in Denmark, but we need to educate people. And uh, because there are only a few people in Denmark that actually knows, a lot of people present themselves as experts but can't even answer a simple question is, is how much does Poland's power plants cost? And I know several people that can answer that question, even though it was one of our most famous experts in Denmark. So education, I think, is the first step. But that's more if somebody has something to add. Um, I think it's a good question because we also have to remember to differentiate between which fields of expertise different uh, scholars have in the, in, in the academic space. Because, of course, in Denmark we have a lot of system, power system experts uh, and one sitting beside me here. And we have a lot of uh, engineers in Denmark focused on renewable energy systems. And it's great. It's, it's very, very uh, clever and excellent people. But when we introduce questions into the Danish debate about nuclear, there is a deficit in knowledge, also in the University of Denmark. And as uh, the questions were, that we need more education and we need more professionals with knowledge about nuclear inclusion in energy systems from abroad. 
And this is a vital part of it because when we are, as we see now, the, the power energy systems uh, educations in Denmark and the energy systems education, from my point of view, what I see and talk to the students, nuclear doesn't have a part in it. You're not educated on nuclear if you take uh, energy analysis, the system analysis education in Denmark. It's not a part of it. So a priori, nuclear is already out of the equation. So how can we answer these questions from Danish experts when we are not even teaching the students at the universities that should take these educations about nuclear power? So we have one more question here. Yeah, thank you. It's me again from the energy trading industry. <laughs> um, and coming from that industry, I have a couple uh, uh, pointers that I'd like to discuss and then finally ask a question towards you, Jakob. So I can tell you why no energy traders are big uh, proponents in favor of nuclear power. It's simply because it kills our business model. Low volatility means uh, low trading opportunities. It also means that we don't have any value in providing PPA support or balancing support for windmill farms. So considering this uh, massive balancing sector that you're proposing in your report, have you made any considerations around the, the externality costs of having people like energy traders a, a part of the solution who also takes a part of the cake? Because what I hear you say, Christian, is that you are gathering all the stakeholders necessary from producing the power to consuming the power. And that's cutting out a lot of the, uh, the elements in that chain that also take up, you know, they take a, a, a part of the cake. So do you have any considerations about that, Jakob, in your model, how that affects the price? Uh, I don't think we uh, model uh, uh, traders in our uh, power, uh, our energy system uh, uh, models. Uh, but um, in both scenarios with uh, a, a system uh, based on, uh, on renewables and a system based on uh, a nuclear, you need flexibility. So that's the case in, in both uh, scenarios. And we have, uh, I think I also mentioned that, power to X to, uh, in the one case, balance the, the, uh, the, the, the generation and in the nuclear case to balance the demand so the demand becomes flat and the nuclear can operate on, on a more constant uh, base. So in that sense, the, the two scenarios are actually not that, uh, that different. You need flexibility in, in both uh, cases. Uh, and and I, I must admit, I don't know, the, the, the way we, we calculate is uh, the socioeconomic uh, cost of operating and uh, uh, the system and, and doing the investments of the various uh, technologies. Uh, and to which extent the operational costs take into account uh, the, the, uh, the, the energy traders, I, I simply don't know. Uh, but I guess my best guess would be that it's very, very small compared to the energy flows and the cost of that, uh, the, 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 the people for running the energy market. But uh, that's, an, I don't know. Maybe I can add a layer of financial uh, things on top of that. And this is a problem as well, that there's literally very few financial people who are involved in these models. Uh, there is engineers doing the m models and optimization by linear programming, pretty much. Uh, it doesn't take, uh, take into account the real world. And in the real world, volatility equals risk. Risk equals higher cost of capital. Higher cost of capital equals more expensive projects. More expensive projects means that we all have to pay for them. Volatility is not a good thing. Flex is a feature um, of an energy system that is not optimized. That's the main issue of this. You know, in Sweden, we're talking flex with industries, and we wrap it in the notion of flex, but it, from the industry, all they hear is rationing instead. They want to run their plants at 100%. They do not want flex. So from a financial perspective, 
we should optimize the whole system, including the industries as well, in this. Thank you. And we have one more question from down here. Sorry, it's me again. Uh, this is for Stefan and your uh, political perspective on the situation. Um, Denmark and most of our neighboring countries are fairly good and are not the biggest issues on the global scale of climate change. Um, so my question is, how can we as a nation, as well as the EU as a collective, begin to put pressure on those much larger offenders like US, China, Russia, India, um, to make the changes that are needed to truly solve these problems? Because right now it feels like we smaller nations are simply trying to make up for the environmental destruction caused by those much more powerful nations? That's an excellent and very, very large question, which would require another day uh, of uh, a conference just to go through that, I think. But very broadly speaking, of course, we should try to lead the way by being our self-proclaimed leaders of the green transition. I think leading by example is a very strong point. And also, it, it, the, when, when, they, when they critique that we say that they should save on their CO2 emissions, they very often use the arguments that, what about yourself, what are you doing? Would you like to live as we do now? You have tr uh, transgressed to a higher standard of living. And very often that will require them to change their own ways of, of, of living. I don't think those arguments are unfair. And to be able to be a leader of a good example, we should be able to take our own medicine. And if we cannot design systems that are efficient and good and lead to a better future for ourselves, then they would not adopt them. That's the, that's the underlying point. And obviously, wind industry will have a big big factor to play in that. I think that's a Danish core competency in uh, in our industries. Uh, but maybe maybe we should not try to design a total system that we would never see used in China or in, or in the US if we want to lead by example. Just a very quick follow-up. Um, so what I'm hearing you say is that you think that if we as EU, for example, become sustainable uh, reliant, the US, China, Russia will follow suit on their own volition? I think there is a lot of different things that needs to be taken into consideration here, which is partially their own volition. I, they, they will also suffer consequences from a uh, too, too high warming of the, of the globe, of course. Uh, but they would also want to be portrayed as good trading partners. They would also want to have access to our open markets. They would also want to be part of a geopolitical balance uh, where, where they're not excluded from the, from the nice round tables that they want to be in. So there are many different things that should be all equally applied. But we can never say to them that they should turn green unless we are doing it somewhat ourselves. That's, that's the main point. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's me again. Um, two quick comments, one, one comment and, and um, one question. Um, in relation to flexibility, uh, I think that's, there's actually hiding a, a deeper philosophical question uh, behind the idea of flexible consumption because if we, or if you as energy planners in Klimarådet are proposing that people should use less when we have less energy, you are actually putting the machines or the systems before the humans. And I think that's a very interesting way to go about securing a society's needs. I think society and humans' needs should become, come before the, uh, the system. And then I'd also like to correct a point you made. Um, you said that nuclear and renewables have the same problem with not being 100% matched with demand. Um, and there's a huge difference. Nuclear is producing in quite a straight line. Um, and it's much easier to match that with the varying demand that is a bit higher in the day and a bit lower in the night time than if you have a week without wind. So it's qualitatively two very different things. And I honestly don't think it's correct to say that they have the same flexibility issues. So that's my comment. Um, and then a question. I hear a little bit um, talking around the edges here about Denmark actually having many of the same issues as Sweden or other, peop uh, other countries that are deciding to build nuclear. So our energy minister, um, Lars Ågaard, here in Denmark from Moderaterne, he says quite triumphantly, oh, why, why would we even talk about nuclear? Nobody want to invest in it. So I'd like to hear from Rolls-Royce or Schanful. 
if nuclear energy was legalized, would it be an interesting investment case? And do you see any logic in his argumentation here? I, I find it circular, to be honest. I could perhaps take that. Uh, in, in short, potentially very much a yes in terms of the market. We as company are actually now very, very much focused on the Nordics uh, as, a, as a key priority, number one market for Rolls-Royce. We see it as a, a stable platform uh, with the best proficiency uh, and also with a lot of play, players and operators that are proficient compared to a, a number of other ones. There's two things that, that I would recommend to do. Is first is to partner up with an operator or, or, or an entity that knows project management in terms of nuclear. Don't reinvent the wheel. wheel. To, to, you know, partner up with, it could be just as an example, Fortum for, uh, or, or, or another company for uh, doing something like that, even though you chose the wrong reactor. No, I haven't chosen yet. <laughs> oh, really? No, let's go and have a beer. Uh, and, the, and, and the second point I wanted to make is licensing. Again, don't re reinvent the wheel. What we are trying to do is to bring those regulators together to re assess the design at the same time instead of them doing it again and again and again and again. It is being reviewed by the UK safety regulator, uh, Office for Nuclear Regulation. It takes years to do that process. We are not now in pretty much middle of it. If we do that same licensing process again, be it even in Sweden or Finland, it doesn't add any safety. It's just an incredibly expensive uh, pile of paper. I'm really glad that Stuck is not here, to be honest now. Uh, but I'm just trying to say that regulation upon regulation doesn't add any benefit. So what, what to do instead, especially if you're a newcomer country to nuclear, such as uh, Denmark or Norway, where we are engaged uh, as well, or Poland, what to do is what we call an assessment of an assessment. So you look at the work that has already been done and look at the methodology and how it's been done, and then you approve that instead of uh, doing that same multi-year process again. So partnering up and doing licensing in a much smarter way. And now we have two questions Regulatory. left. We, we've only got one and a half. Yeah, but it's diversity. We have one uh, quick question. Could, could I reply yeah, on, on the question? Fine, sorry. Uh, okay, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, just a, a few few uh, comments to, to the question. Uh, I, I, I don't say, I didn't say that, that there's the same amount uh, of flexibility need in the two scenarios. There's need for flexibility in both. And of course, it's, it's different because of the different nature of the, the various uh, sources. And I think we also explain and, and also put uh, uh, krona or euro on that in, in, the, uh, in the report. And regarding uh, uh, the energy services, of course, we should first of all deliver the energy services. So we should not start uh, or stop uh, our factories or, or something like that. We should uh, uh, use the flexible uh, demand that, that naturally can be flexible. For instance, uh, I think uh, several people that have an electric vehicle nowadays has an app uh, that uh, automatically starts the charging when the price is low, uh, when there's uh, available energy in the, in the system, or they uh, uh, start it uh, manually when the uh, price is low. And that is actually uh, flex uh, flexibility from, from demand uh, uh, side. Uh, and then I'd just like to underline, I'm not from the Climate Council. <laughs> uh, that's Marie, uh, just to, uh, to, to don't uh, make any confusions about that. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question, a very brief question. Thank you, also a very brief question. My name is Louise Faslakic. I'm the new chairman of IDA Nuclear, a new network for uh, communication and networking about exactly knowledge and uh, a debate. Why question is, is more like a comment. Listen, 
this is the climate crisis we're addressing, right? It's not the cost of the pro of the, um, the the production, so to say, or the investment, really. It is what we as a society can gain relative to the climate spectrum. We need to address this quickly. So that's first. And second is, as Macong, one of the famous also uh, um, international men who should know about this issue. They have tried both renewables as well as nuclear. And his comment was, and that's what I really want to relay here, only renewables doesn't work. Only nuclear doesn't work. But the combination, that's it. And we should go that way in understanding each other's uh, problems as well as capabilities. So that's my comment. Thank you. <clears throat> I think that was a yeah. very wise well, decision. We, to I think we're close for questions now, no? Because now, otherwise we're running over time. Yeah, exactly. And it's Sorry. nice weather outside. Sorry. There are a few people so, burning so, inside. And now, of course, of course, I'm going to make a 20-minute speech. No, I'm not. <laughs> no. Uh, just one, one comment, because I didn't want to break into the good conversation down here, but I remember, uh, uh, Tom, when, when, we, when we looked at your slides uh, some, uh, some weeks ago, uh, when you had this time, uh, and, and I don't remember, don't know whether you remember the slide, but he's basically telling us about the different periods, and I think it's 24, you're kind of ready, ready to go into the construction, no? Is that true? No, that's uh, 26 when oh, 26. we have factory yeah. manufacturing capability yeah. and the licensing process is done in the UK. Yeah, 20, then yeah. it's and, and, and then you have, you, you have, I think also you said you have like four factories uh, uh, in the making, and at, at a certain time, you can you can make uh, 16 or something like this mod modules per year. The only reason I'm bringing it up, I mean, you can just say very soon. Yeah, short, it's uh, three factories, uh, four power plants per year. Yeah. So uh, coming from those, and yeah. what we are looking at is first set of factories going to be in the UK. Yeah. We can supply from mm -hmm. there, but then we are looking at mm -hmm. second set of those factories elsewhere yeah. in the Europe, dependent on demand. And it's not to make a special commercial for Rolls Royce. It's only to give the example. Can you imagine what happens if everyone starts to clear up and they start uh, ordering SMR, small modular reactors? Uh, we, we are probably going to have the first delivery in our, uh, here at, in our country in 2060 or something if we don't get onto the game, get on the waiting list. And, and uh, I think you much agree to that. No? So wh who, whether it's uh, GE, Hitachi, or it's Rolls Royce or whatever, we cannot sit here and wait. And um, uh, Thomas and I, when we made the symposium, we called it the first uh, symposium for the green and stable energy. And uh, we did it, of course, because we thought we, sh we should have this kind of conversa conversation as we have had today, for which I think we're both uh, very thankful that we have had. But uh, what is then the next action? And uh, we have discussed that, and, and I believe that we have more or less agreed the next action is we need to at least uh, you can say, can you uh, create a think tank or a task group? I don't know, but we created this out of, uh, of nothing with support with, uh, from a lot of good people. So our next goal will be that we need to have a think tank or uh, a task group with people from, yeah, from in, uh, universities, but definitely people from the industry and also from the financial part of, of society so we can really get a plan up and running. And, and and, and communications. And if we don't get our act together now, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I think uh, the, the train has taken off uh, for, uh, for this country and we are living from what we are manufacturing and the services we are providing. And if we don't have power 10% of the time or whatever, it's a catastrophe, I can only say that. So, okay, that was all for that speech. And then it's actually only here at the very last point to say thank you very much to uh, everyone that participated, you, I must say, you lived up to all our expectations, and I think though we could have had more, let's say, nuclear skeptics in here, I th still think that it was very nuanced, and you, and, and you covered all the aspects, and a good internal and external discussion with the customers, with, customers, with, the, with our audience. And uh, so I think actually that is all. Thank you, everyone, and it's been a great day for me. Can I say that for you also, Thomas? Yes, I would like to say thank you also. I think and, great and, and actually, Thomas would like to. <laughs> yeah, I thought, I thought Kim would be too embarrassed <laughs> because we've been doing this just out of our own pocket and using a lot of time. So if you were happy with the symposium, you can uh, donate uh, a small amount to this phone number uh, so that um, 
Me and Kim get some sort of uh, then our kids will go on vacation this year, so. for 200, <laughs> 200 hours work. So um, yeah, and uh, and there will be half. An maybe hour. you put maybe you put the number up over there. I'll the put people. the number yeah. up over there, and uh, we'll be hanging out in the hall anyway. The next half hour. Yeah. So you probably got all kinds of questions and want to talk to each other or whatever. So we'll be staying out there for half an hour. Yes. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, thank you. everyone.